In the serene embrace of night, under a canopy adorned with shimmering stars, where the line between the real and the mystical fades away, a gateway appears, beckoning us into a realm of awe and intrigue, the astral plane. This text invites you to delve into the depths of this mysterious universe, guided by the visionary wisdom of Charles Webster Leadbeater, a daring explorer of esoteric realms whose fearless curiosity and compassionate spirit have illuminated the secrets of dimensions beyond our grasp. Join us on a journey where realities intertwine with dreams, boundaries dissolve, and endless possibilities unfold. Prepare yourself for an expedition that will challenge your perceptions and ignite the fires of imagination. Introduction Theosophical actors have often mentioned the astral plane, also known as Lit Fu in Sanskrit, and in our books we can find fragments of information about this realm of nature. However, until now there has been no complete work to which we can refer for a comprehensive synthesis of the facts we know about this fascinating region. The purpose of this manual is to gather and organize these scattered pieces of information and to supplement them with new data discovered in our research. It should be noted that these additions come solely from the discoveries of a few explorers and should not be considered authoritative, but rather as valuable contributions. We have taken all possible precautions to ensure the accuracy of this manual. No fact, ancient or recent, has been included unless confirmed by at least two qualified and independent researchers among us, and also approved by more experienced students whose knowledge of these subjects far exceeds our own. With this rigour, we hope that this account of the astral plane, although not completely exhaustive, is as reliable as possible. The first aspect we must clarify in describing this astral plane is its absolute reality. By using the word reality, we do not refer to its metaphysical aspect, where everything except the unmanifested is considered unreal due to its impermanence. Here we speak of reality in the common and everyday sense. The objects and beings of the astral plane are as real as our bodies, our houses, or our monuments, in fact, as real as Charing Cross, as aptly expressed in one of the early theosophical writings. Although they do not last forever like the objects of the physical plane, they are realities from our perspective as long as they exist, realities that we cannot ignore simply because the majority of humanity is not yet aware or only vaguely aware of their existence. It is evident that there is considerable misunderstanding even among theosophical students about the reality of the different planes of the universe. One reason for this confusion may be attributed to the vague and occasional use of the word plane. In our theosophical literature, writers have spoken vaguely of the mental plane, the moral plane, and others, which has led many people to believe that this information is speculative and inaccurate, simply a hypothesis without conclusive evidence. It is essential to intellectually understand that in its solar system there are perfectly defined planes, each with its own matter of varying degrees of density. Some of these planes can be visited and observed by qualified individuals, similarly to visiting and observing a foreign country. By comparing the observations of those who work on these planes consistently, it is possible to obtain evidence of their existence and nature, at least as satisfactory as the evidence we have of the existence of geographical locations like Greenland or Spitsbergen. The common given names for these planes, in order of increasing materiality to increasing subtlety, are the physical plane, the astral plane, the devachanic plane, the upper plane, and the nirvanic plane. Additionally, there are two more planes above Nirvana, but they are beyond our current power of conception, and thus for the moment we leave them out of consideration. It is crucial to understand that the matter in each of these planes differs from the matter of the lower plane, similar but to a much higher degree than the difference between steam and solid matter. In fact, the states of matter we know as solid, liquid and gaseous are only the three lowest divisions of matter belonging to this single physical plane. The astral region, which I will describe, is the second of the great planes of nature, situated just above or within the physical world with which we are all familiar. It has often been called the realm of illusion, not because it is intrinsically more illusory than the physical world, but due to the extreme unreliability of impressions received by an inexperienced seer in this plane. 
This is primarily due to two distinctive characteristics of the astral world. Firstly, many of its inhabitants have the astonishing ability to change shape rapidly and can exert virtually unlimited charm over those with whom they interact. Secondly, vision in this plane is very different and more extensive than physical vision. An object is perceived from all sides simultaneously. Even the interior of a solid object is as clearly visible as its exterior. Therefore, it is understandable that an inexperienced visitor to this new world may encounter significant difficulties in understanding what they are actually seeing, and even more so in expressing their vision with words, as ordinary language is inadequate for describing these experiences. A common example of an error that could occur is the inversion of figures that the seer tries to read in astral light, which could lead them to translate, for instance, the number 139 as 931 and so on. In the case of an occult student who has been trained by an expert master, such errors would be practically impossible unless due to haste or extreme negligence. An advanced student has undergone a lengthy and varied process of instruction in the art of correctly seeing the astral plane. The master, or a more experienced student, repeatedly presents various forms of illusion and asks the neophyte what they see, correcting any errors in their responses and explaining the reasons behind them. In this way, the student gradually gains certainty and confidence in confronting phenomena of the astral plane that far surpass anything possible in physical life. However, they must not only learn to see correctly, but also to accurately transfer the memory of what they have seen from one plane to another. To assist in this aspect, they are trained to maintain uninterrupted consciousness when moving from the physical plane to the astral or devachanic plane, and vice versa. This is essential because as long as they cannot do this, there is a possibility that their memories may be partially lost or distorted during the white interval that separates their periods of consciousness in the different planes. Once they fully acquire this ability to move from one plane to another with total awareness, the disciple will benefit from the use of all astral faculties, not only during sleep or trance when out of their body, but also when fully awake and conscious in everyday physical life. It is true that some theosophists have disregarded the astral plane and consider it unworthy of attention, but I consider this to be a mistaken view. While it is true that our ultimate goal must be purely spiritual development, it would be disastrous for a student to completely neglect the astral plane. It is possible that some, due to their particular karma, may initially develop purely spiritual faculties by temporarily omitting the astral plane. Then, when they finally encounter it, if they have made solid spiritual progress, they can engage with it from a higher perspective, spiritual insight, and unwavering spiritual strength. However, it is incorrect to assume that this is the only method or even the common method used by the masters of wisdom with their students. While advantageous when possible, for most of us, our progression is slower due to past imperfections or errors, and we can only advance gradually step by step. And since the astral plane is closely linked to our world of denser matter, it is generally where we experience our first supraphysical experiences. Therefore, the astral plane is of great interest to those of us who are novices in these studies. Understanding its mysteries can be of great importance not only for comprehending seemingly inexplicable phenomena like seances or haunted houses, but also for protecting ourselves and others from potential dangers. The first encounter with this extraordinary region can happen in different ways. Some only experience it once in their lifetime, under an unusual influence, with a sensitivity sufficient to recognize the presence of one of its inhabitants, and perhaps since the experience does not repeat itself, they may eventually believe it was a hallucination. Others begin to see and hear things that others around them do not perceive, and over time, this also increases. There are also those who start to remember more and more clearly what they saw or heard in the astral plane during sleep. Among those studying these subjects, some attempt to develop astral vision by observing crystals or using other methods. Those fortunate enough to have the direct guidance of a qualified master may be led to the astral plane under their special protection, which continues until the student is approved and ready to face any danger or challenge they may encounter in whatever form it may appear. 
the first awakening to the awareness that there is a vast world filled with active life, of which most people are unaware, is a memorable moment in every individual's life. It is true that life on the astral plane is abundant and diverse, which can be bewildering for a novice, and even for the most experienced researcher. Classifying and cataloguing life on this plane is no easy task. Imagine an explorer in an unknown tropical jungle, asked to fully describe the country they passed through, including precise details about the plants and minerals they saw, as well as the genus and species of each of the countless insects, birds, beasts, and reptiles. It would be an overwhelming undertaking. Yet even this does not compare to the difficulties faced by the psychic researcher. In their case, things are even more complicated due to the difficulty of accurately translating memories of what they saw in the astral plane onto the physical plane, and also due to the inadequacy of ordinary language to express many of the experiences they must recount. While a physical plane explorer might begin their account of a country with a general description of its landscape and features, similarly, it is fitting to begin with a brief overview of the astral plane in an attempt to give an idea of the backdrop of its marvellous and ever-changing activities. However, here we encounter an almost insurmountable difficulty due to the extreme complexity of the subject. Those who fully see the astral plane agree that trying to evoke a vivid picture of this astral landscape to those whose eyes are not yet open is like speaking to a blind person about the exquisite variety of colours in a twilight sky. Regardless of the accuracy and elaboration of the description, there is no certainty that the idea presented in the listener's mind is an adequate representation of the truth. On the astral plane, forms are extremely fluid, and impressions are subjective and varied according to each individual's perception. Moreover, the limitation of earthly language to describe non-physical experiences makes it even more difficult to accurately convey what is experienced in the astral plane. Only those who have fully developed their psychic faculties can fully understand and adequately describe the complexity and richness of life in this plane. For others, it is a realm filled with mystery and wonder, whose complete understanding surpasses ordinary words. Primarily, it is important to understand that the astral plane is divided into seven parts, each with its own level of materiality and corresponding material condition. Numbering from the highest and least material to the lowest, we find that they naturally divide into three groups. Divisions 1, 2 and 3 form one group, while divisions 4, 5 and 6 form another, and the seventh stands alone as the lowest of all. The difference between the matter of one class and the next would be comparable to that between a solid and a liquid, while the difference between subdivisions within the same class would be more akin to that between two types of solids, such as sand and gravel. Focusing on divisions 4, 5 and 6, these are linked to the physical world in which we live, with all its familiar elements. The sixth division represents our daily life on Earth, but without the physical body or its needs. Moving towards the fifth and fourth divisions, the reality of matter diminishes and moves further away from our lower world and its interests. The landscape of these lower divisions is essentially similar to the Earth we know, but seen from an astral perspective, even physical objects are presented differently. Astral vision allows them to be perceived from all sides simultaneously, which can be confusing at first. Moreover, every particle inside a solid object is as visible as those on the outside, which can make initially familiar objects unrecognizable. However, this astral vision more closely approximates the true perception of physical sight. For example, in the astral plane, the sides of a crystal cube appear equal as they truly are, whereas in the physical plane, due to perspective, some sides may appear smaller than others, which is an illusion. In addition to these potential sources of error, astral vision can perceive forms of physical matter that are invisible under normal conditions, such as particles in the atmosphere, and various emanations emitted by living beings. There is also a finer order of physical matter called etheric, which interacts with and is affected by higher forces. Although we have imagined everything that has been mentioned, we still do not understand half of the complexity of the problem. In addition to the mentioned new forms of physical matter, we must face even more numerous and bewildering subdivisions of astral matter. Each material object, 
even each particle, has its astral equivalent that is extremely complex and composed of different classes of astral matter. Similarly, every living being is surrounded by its own atmosphere, known as an aura. In the case of humans, the aura is an oval structure of luminous mist with impressive complexity, sometimes referred to as the auric egg. Observing this aura is a fascinating branch of study, and those who develop astral vision can verify the accuracy of the teachings provided by Madame Blavatsky on some of the seven principles of man. With this astral vision, not only is the external appearance of being seen, but other layers of their being are clearly distinguished. For example, the etheric double known in theosophical literature as the Linga Sharira is shown as coextensive with the physical body. The jiva is also perceived, which is linked to the circulation of prana and manifests as a pink light radiating from a healthy person. The brightest and easiest aspect to see belonging to an order of astral matter is the karmic aura, expressed by bursts of color representing the different desires passing through a person's mind at every moment. Behind this aura, made up of a subtler degree of matter, lies the lower mana body and aura, whose colors show the disposition and character of personality. Higher and more beautiful still when clearly developed, there is the Karana Sharira light, the aura or vehicle of the higher mana, reflecting the degree of development of the true ego in its cycle from birth to birth. It is essential to understand that these auras are not mere emanations, but the actual manifestation of the ego in their respective planes. The auric egg is the true human being, not the physical body that crystallizes within it on this plane. When the ego is at the arupa levels of the Deva Bhashan, it inhabits the Karana Sharira. Descending to the Rupa levels, it needs to don its matter, thus forming its lower mana body or mental body, similar to its descent to the astral plane where it forms its astral body or kamic with its matter. Although retaining all its other bodies as it descends even further to this physical plane, the physical body forms inside the auric egg that contains the human being in its entirety. While the karmic aura with its bright bursts of color may be more evident, the nervous ether and etheric double are actually of a denser order of matter. Though invisible to ordinary sight, the term astral has been used in theosophical literature to describe the linga sharira as the astral counterpart of the human body. However, a more thorough and precise investigation leads us to admit that much of this invisible matter is purely physical. Therefore, we define the linga sharira not as astral, but as the etheric double. The etheric double consists of several degrees of matter termed ether by scientists, which is a finer subdivision than gaseous matter, and can be found in any class of physical matter through the application of appropriate forces. This revision of nomenclature allows us to be more precise in our description and to avoid misunderstandings that may arise due to differences in the meanings of terms in Eastern books. If we observe the body of a newborn endowed with psychic faculties, we will notice that it is imbued not only with astral matter of varying densities, but also with different degrees of etheric matter. The etheric double, which serves as the mold for the construction of the physical body, is formed by the agents of the lords of karma, while the descending ego automatically gathers astral matter as it passes through the astral plane during its incarnation. Firstly, it is important to understand that the astral plane is divided into seven parts, each with its own level of materiality and corresponding material condition, numbering the subdivisions according to the type of subrays and individual karma of a person. Since these subdivisions of matter are formed by many combinations, which in turn create aggregates that enter into the structure of the atom of the chemical element called. It is understood that this second principle of man is very complex and its possible variations are practically infinite. The Lipicus, cosmic entities responsible for karmic recording, can provide an appropriate mold for body formation according to an individual's karma, no matter how complicated or unusual it may be. Another important aspect of astral vision is its ability to enlarge any physical particle to any desired size, as if it were a microscope. In fact, its magnification power far exceeds that of any microscope created by science. Thus, the occult student can perceive hypothetical molecules and atoms as postulated by science 
although recognizing them as much more complex in nature than what science has discovered so far. Astral vision offers a vast field of study of absorbing interest, where a scientific researcher with this faculty could experiment with new perspectives and understand ordinary and known phenomena in a deeper way. Also, they could discover completely different colors beyond the ordinarily visible spectrum, such as ultra-red and ultraviolet rays that science has discovered in other ways but are clearly perceptible to the eye. While these subjects are fascinating, it is necessary to return to the object of giving a general idea of the appearance of the astral plane. At this point, it is evident that on the astral plane, although ordinary objects of the physical world are part of life, their appearance and actual characteristics are much more comprehensive and different from what we are accustomed to seeing. Take the case of a rock to illustrate this point. When you observe it with trained vision on the astral plane, it is not simply an inert mass of stone. First, you can see all the physical matter of the rock instead of just a part of it. Then the vibrations of the rock's physical particles are perceptible. Thirdly, you can observe its astral counterpart composed of different degrees of astral matter, whose particles are also in constant motion. Fourthly, you can see how universal life, the HIA, flows through the rock and radiates from it. Fifthly, you can appreciate an aura surrounding it, although less extensive and varied than in the higher realms. And finally, you can perceive the elemental essence that permeates it, always active but fluctuating. For the vegetable, animal and human kingdoms, complications are naturally much more numerous and complex. Some might object that most mediums, who occasionally glimpse the astral world, do not describe such complexities or report entities during sessions. This is because few, whether living or deceased, see things as they really are, without long experience on this plane. Even those with full vision often feel dizzy and confused, making their understanding and recollection difficult. Among the small minority who can see and remember, few can translate these experiences into understandable language on our lower plane. Many untrained mediums do not examine their visions scientifically at all. They simply get an impression that may be accurate, but also incomplete or even misleading. The latter hypothesis is all the more plausible because deceptions and frauds from inhabitants of the astral plane are common, and the inexperienced person is powerless against them. It is important to remember that regular inhabitants of the astral plane, whether human or elemental, are generally aware only of objects on that plane. Physical matter is completely invisible to them, just as astral matter is to most of humanity. Although every physical object has its astral counterpart that would be visible to them, the distinction between the two is essential for fully understanding the subject. However, if an astral entity works constantly through a medium, their finest astral senses may gradually become less subtle, becoming insensitive to higher degrees of matter in their own plane and encompassing the physical world as we perceive it. Only those who are trained in both lives and who are fully conscious in both planes can rely on both clearly and harmoniously. Complexity exists, and only those who fully perceive it and study it scientifically can protect themselves against errors or deceptions. Regarding the seventh division, the lowest of the astral plane, this physical world of ours is like the background, but what is good, beautiful and bright seems invisible. Those who are at this level live an existence dark and filled with horror, as described by the scribe Ani on the Egyptian papyrus thousands of years ago. It is a deep, impenetrable place, black as night, where beings wander defenseless. However, this darkness is the product of their own creation, and the inhabitants of this level live in a state of perpetual evil and horror, creating their own hell. The exploration of this section of the astral plane can be unpleasant for most students, as there is a sensation of density and coarse materiality that is indescribably repugnant to the liberated astral body. There is a feeling of having to navigate through a black, viscous fluid, and the inhabitants and influences found there are also generally undesirable. The first, second and third subdivisions of the astral plane seem much further removed from the physical world and are therefore less material. Entities inhabiting these levels are deeply absorbed in themselves and largely create their own environment, which is sufficiently objective to be perceived by other entities as well as clairvoyant vision. 
This region is often referred to as the Summerland in spiritualist seances, and entities descending from it and describing it may speak the truth as far as their knowledge goes. In these plains, spirits temporarily create homes, schools and cities that seem very real to them, although closer examination may reveal differences from what their creators assume. In these levels, communications are limited by the knowledge of the entity, just as on Earth. While a person capable of functioning freely on the astral plane can easily and quickly communicate with other human entities, through mental impressions, the inhabitants themselves seem to be restricted and do not always use this power, forming similar groups united by sympathies, beliefs and common languages. An important aspect of the astral plane is the records of astral light, which are a kind of photographic representation of everything that has happened in the past. These records are continuously recorded in the upper medium called Akasha and are reflected more or less spasmodically in astral light. Those whose power of vision does not rise above this plane can only obtain occasional and disjointed images of the past instead of a coherent narrative. However, on the astral plane, images of various past events are constantly replayed, which is an important part of the environment for those exploring it. Now that we have outlined the context of our tableau, we will proceed to complete the figures by describing the inhabitants of the astral plane. The great variety of these entities makes their classification extremely difficult. Perhaps the most practical approach is to divide them into three main categories, humans, non-humans and artificial entities. Regarding humans, human inhabitants of the astral plane naturally divide into two groups, the living and the dead, or more precisely, those who still have a physical body and those who do not. Living entities manifesting on the astral plane during physical life can be divided into four classes. First, the adept ocular in the Mavira. This body is the artificial link used in the four lower divisions or rupa of the Banik plane by those who can function there while still alive on earth, and it is formed by the substance of the mental body. Initially, the disciple cannot build it himself and must settle for his ordinary astral body composed of less refined matter from the karmic aura. However, at a certain stage of their progress, the master themselves creates their Mavya Rupa for them for the first time, then instructs and assists them until they can quickly and easily do it themselves. Once this link is acquired, it is commonly used instead of the coarser astral body because it allows for instant passage from the astral plane to the Banik plane and vice versa at will and enables constant use of the higher powers specific to that plane. It is important to note that a person traveling in the Mayavi Rupa is not perceptible to astral vision alone unless they decide to manifest themselves by gathering astral matter particles to temporarily create a suitable body on that plane. However, such a temporary creation would resemble only the ordinary astral body, similar to how a materialization resembles the physical body. In both cases, this is a manifestation of a higher entity in a lower plane, with the purpose of becoming visible to those whose senses cannot yet transcend this plane. Whether in the Mayavi Rupa or in the astral body, the disciple entering the astral plane under the direction of a competent master always retains there as complete consciousness as possible. Indeed, they are themselves as their friends know them on earth, except for the absence of the lower four principles in the former case and the lower three in the latter, and the presence of additional powers and faculties derived from it, allowing them to more easily and effectively accomplish the theosophical work that occupies much of their waking thoughts. Their ability to fully and accurately remember in the physical plane what they have done or learned in the other plane largely depends, as mentioned earlier, on their ability to maintain uninterrupted consciousness when transitioning from one state to another. Second, the psychically developed person who is not under the direction of a master. This person may or may not be spiritually developed, as the two forms of progress are not necessarily linked. When someone is born with psychic powers, it is simply the result of efforts undertaken in a previous incarnation that may have been noble and selfless, or ignorant, misdirected, or even unworthy. When out of the body, they are generally perfectly conscious, but due to lack of proper training, they can easily be deceived by what they perceive. On many occasions, they will be able to explore the various
subdivisions of the astral plane almost as extensively as people in the last category. However, they are often attracted to some to the detriment of others and rarely beyond their influences. The accuracy of their memory of what they experienced can vary, ranging from perfect clarity to total distortion or even complete forgetting. They will always appear in their astral body because by assumption they do not know how to form the Mayavi Rupa. Third, the ordinary person, that is, someone without any psychic development, they float in their astral body in a more or less unconscious state during deep sleep. The higher principles in their astral connection almost invariably withdraw from the body and remain practically asleep next to it. However, in some cases, this astral body is less lethargic and moves dreamily on various astral currents, sometimes recognizing other people in a similar condition and living a variety of pleasant and unpleasant experiences. The memory of these experiences inevitably confused and often deformed to a grotesque extent of what actually happened, can lead the individual to think, waking up in the morning, that they had an extraordinary dream. These astral bodies that separate from the physical are almost shapeless and very undefined in outline in the case of less developed races and individuals. However, as human beings progress intellectually and spiritually, their floating astral form becomes better defined and more closely resembles their physical envelope. As humanity's psychic faculties are evolving, and individuals are at different stages of development, this class naturally blends through imperceptible transitions with the four previously mentioned. The Black Mage, or their Disciple. This category closely corresponds to the first mentioned, with the distinction that their development has been for malevolent rather than benevolent purposes and the acquired powers are used purely selfishly instead of benefiting humanity. Among the lower ranks are members of the black race who practice terrifying rituals, from schools of Ovia or Voodoo, as well as sorcerers from various primitive tribes. At the top of this class, due to their high intellect and therefore greater guilt, are the Tibetan black magicians, whom Europeans often erroneously call Ugpa. In reality, this title would correctly correspond to the Bhutanese subdivision of the larger Kagyu sect, which is part of what could be called the semi-reformed school of Tibetan Buddhism. The Dukpas do practice tantric magic to some extent, but the true unreformed sect of the Red Hats is the Nyingma. Although much lower in their level are the Bonpa, practitioners of the Aboriginal religion, who have never accepted any form of Buddhism. However, it is important to note that all Tibetan sects, except for the Galugpa, are not necessarily completely evil. A more accurate perspective would be that, given that the rules of some other sects allow greater flexibility in life and practice, it is likely that the proportion of selfish seekers among them is higher than among stricter reformers. On the astral plane, the seeker will occasionally find students of occultism from various parts of the world affiliated with lodges completely independent of the known masters of the theosophists, and in many cases these students are serious and selfless in their search for truth. However, it should be mentioned that all these lodges are aware of the existence of the Great Brotherhood of the Himalayas, and recognize that among its members are the greatest adepts known on earth at present. Regarding the deceased, it is important to note first that the term is ambiguous and absurd, as most entities classified under this category are as alive as we are, but they are momentarily separated from a physical body. These entities can be subdivided into nine main classes. The Nirmanakaya is mentioned only to complete the catalogue, as it is very rare for such a high being to manifest in a plane as low as this one. However, if they deemed it necessary for some reason related to their sublime work, they would probably create a temporary astral body for this purpose, much like an adept would use the Mayir Rupa, since their finest attire would be invisible on the astral plane. In theosophical literature, it has often been mentioned that a disciple, upon reaching a certain stage under the guidance of their master, may escape the action of the natural law that generally leads human beings to a state of banishment after death. Instead, the disciple receives their just reward in the full realization of all the spiritual forces that their highest aspirations set in motion during their earthly life. This disciple must be a person of pure life and lofty thought, which likely implies that their spiritual forces are exceptionally strong, 
if they choose to follow the path of renunciation, following in the footsteps of the great renouncing master, Gautama Buddha. They can use this reserve of strength for the benefit of humanity and participate in the work of the Nirmanakayas. Although this path involves sacrificing centuries of intense bliss in Devachan, the advantage is that they can continue their life of work and progress without interruption. When this disciple passes away, they simply relinquish their body as they have done on other occasions and wait on the astral plane for their master to arrange an appropriate reincarnation for them. However, they must be cautious and refrain from comatose during the process, as if they touch the plane of banishment. Even for a moment, they could be drawn again into the normal evolutionary line by an irresistible current. On rare occasions, they may be allowed to avoid a new birth directly into the adult body of someone whose previous mind no longer needs that body. However, this situation is not common, and they generally must wait on the astral plane until an appropriate reincarnation opportunity arises. While waiting, the disciple does not waste time as they remain fully conscious and capable of pursuing their work more swiftly and effectively, without the physical limitations of the body. Their awareness allows them to voluntarily explore all divisions of the Kaloka with ease. These disciples awaiting reincarnation are not common on the astral plane, but with the advancement of human evolution and more people entering the path of holiness, it is likely that this class will become more numerous. Thirdly, the ordinary person after death. It is undeniable that this category is much larger than the previously mentioned ones, and the members composing it vary considerably in character and condition. Similarly, the duration of their stay on the astral plane can also vary considerably. While some stay only a few days or hours, others may extend their stay for many years, even centuries. Those who have led a noble and pure life, whose desires and aspirations have been altruistic and spiritual, feel no attraction to this plane. If left completely alone, they find little to hold or motivate them to action, even during the brief period of their stay after death. The true being withdraws within themselves, much like in the first stage of the detachment process where the physical body is discarded, and almost immediately the etheric double and prana as well. They also seek to free themselves as quickly as possible from the astral body or kamarupa, and thus gain access to the state of banishment where their spiritual aspirations can find full realization. The noble and spiritually pure individual will be capable of achieving this, having mastered all earthly passions during their life. Their will has been directed towards higher goals, so the energy of lower desire in Kaloka will be weak. Therefore their stay there will be brief, and they will likely have only a dreamlike awareness of existence until they immerse themselves in sleep, where their higher principles will finally be freed from the karmic envelope and enter the blessed rest of Devachan. For those who have not yet embarked on the path of occult development, what is described is an ideal state of affairs, but naturally it is not attained by all, not even by the majority. Most ordinary people do not completely free themselves from lower desires before death and require a long period of life in the astral plane with some degree of consciousness to allow for the development and release of the forces they have generated, thereby liberating the higher self. During this period, they occupy the Kamarupa, which is a reorganization of the matter of their astral body. Unlike the astral body, which is sufficiently awake during life to visit all or most subdivisions of its plane, the Kamarupa does not have this freedom. It is strictly confined to the level to which its affinities have drawn it. However, it undergoes a form of progression, as the forces set in motion during earthly life necessitate its functioning in more than just one division of Kaloka. Consequently, it follows a regular sequence, starting from the lowest levels and exhausting its attractions at each level. Most of its denser particles fall away, and the Kamarupa finds affinity with a slightly higher state of existence. Its specific density constantly decreases, moving from the densest strata to the more refined, only stopping when it achieves a temporary balance. This explains the frequent observation made by entities appearing during sessions, mentioning that they are about to ascend to a higher sphere. From this level onward, it would be difficult, if not impossible, to communicate through an ordinary medium. 
as an entity in the highest subdivision of the astral plane, would find it nearly impossible to interact with any ordinary medium. It is important to note here that the distinction in contour that separates the Kamarupa from the astral body is entirely different from the description of man's progression in the astral before death. There is no possibility of confusion between these two entities because after death their nature and activity change significantly. While a person is attached to a physical body, the various astral particles are mixed inextricably and constantly change position. However, after death the activity is much more structured as astral particles are classified according to their degree of materiality, thus becoming a series of envelopes or shells surrounding the being, with the coarsest dissipated first leaving the others. However, this dissipation is not necessarily complete as it depends on the power of manners, the mind, to free itself from its connection with any given level. The nature of the shadow that persists after death also depends on this as will be explained later. The romantic idea that death is a universal leveling is an absurdity born of ignorance. In reality, in most cases, the loss of the physical body implies no difference in the character or intellect of the person. Thus, among those we call dead, there are as many varieties of intelligence as among the living. The popular religious teaching in the West about experiences after death has been so inaccurate that even entities feel terribly confused upon regaining consciousness in Kaloka after death. The reality differs radically from what they had been led to expect. In fact, our belief in the immortality of the soul has little practical value, as most people consider simply being conscious as sufficient proof that they have not yet found a doctrine of eternal punishment has also caused great and completely unfounded terror among those who arrive in Kaloka. In many cases, they suffer from periods of acute mental anguish before freeing themselves from the fatal influence of this horrible blasphemy and understanding that the world is not governed by the caprice of a demon who delights in human anguish, but by a benevolent and patient law of evolution. In Kaloka, just as on Earth, there are some who understand something of their situation and know how to make the most of it, while others have not yet acquired this knowledge. Just as here the ignorant are rarely willing to benefit from the counsel or example of the wise, regardless of the level of intelligence an entity possesses, it will always be a fluctuating and progressively diminishing quantity. This occurs because the lower manners is pulled in opposite directions by the higher triad acting upon it from superior levels and by karma operating from lower levels. The entity oscillates between these two attractions with an increasing tendency toward the higher triad as karmic forces diminish. This phenomenon is known in spiritist seances as the development of a spirit through a medium. The purpose of this process is to intensify the downward attraction of the karma, to awaken the lower part of the entity from its natural unconsciousness, and to artificially prolong its life in Kaloka. However, this process carries significant dangers. Firstly, it delays the separation between manas and kama by extending the time between two incarnations. Secondly, it increases the likelihood that a large amount of negative karma will accumulate in the entity, which will need to be resolved in future lives. And thirdly, there is the risk that the abnormal intensification of the kama force will completely entangle the lower manas, leading to the total loss of an incarnation. Although extreme cases like the latter are rare, they have occurred more than once. Even in less severe situations, the individual may lose a significant portion of their lower manas due to this entanglement with karma, more than they would have lost if they had been allowed to withdraw into themselves as nature dictates. While it is recognized that there can sometimes be benefits for severely degraded entities through spirit circles, nature seems to indicate that such help should be provided by occultists trained by competent masters. These students can visit the astral plane during their earthly life and are familiar with the laws governing spiritual evolution, which makes them more secure and effective in their assistance. It is evident that this system of aid, which allows immediate consultation with higher authorities in doubtful cases, is much safer than any occasional help obtained through a medium. Mediums can be entirely ignorant of spiritual laws and are exposed to both malevolent and benevolent influences alike. Besides any consideration of development through a medium, 
there is another influence that has a significant and more frequent impact on a disembodied entity during its passage to Devashan. This is the intense and uncontrollable pain experienced by its surviving friends or family. This excessive pain is one of the sad outcomes of the inaccurate, even religious vision that has prevailed in the West for centuries regarding death. Not only do we inflict unnecessary suffering on ourselves due to the temporary separation from our loved ones, but we also often cause serious harm to those we deeply love due to the intensity of our grief. As recently emphasized by one of our talented writers, when our departed loved one peacefully and naturally plunges into pre devachanic unconsciousness, the passionate pain and desires of the friends remaining on earth can disrupt this process. These feelings generate vibrations in the disembodied entity's kamarupa, reaching and awakening the lower manas that has not yet withdrawn and reunited with its spiritual source. This can cause the disembodied entity to vividly recall the earthly life it has just left. Such awakening can lead to acute suffering and disturb the natural process of releasing the triad, thus delaying its full freedom. Therefore, it would be beneficial for those whose loved ones have passed away before them to learn from these indisputable facts and refrain, for the sake of their loved ones, from experiencing pain that, though natural, is essentially selfish. This does not mean that occult teachings advise forgetting the dead, far from it. However, they suggest that the affectionate remembrance one holds for their departed friend can be a useful force if directed correctly towards sincere desires for progress towards Divachan and a peaceful passage through Kaloka. Conversely, wasting this force in lamentation and desires to retrieve the departed loved one is not only futile, but also harmful. It is with a genuine sense of intuition that Hinduism prescribes its Shraddha ceremonies and the Catholic Church offers its prayers for the dead. These practices can help properly channel the effect and good intentions towards the spiritual progress of the deceased instead of contributing to grief that hinders their evolution. However, there are times when the desire originates from the other side and an entity from the class we consider has something important to convey to those left behind. Sometimes, this message may have significant relevance such as indicating the location of a missing will. However, most of the time, it may seem trivial to us. Nevertheless, regardless of its content, if firmly entrenched in the mind of the departed, it is undoubtedly desirable to allow them to convey it, as otherwise the desire to do so would perpetually keep their consciousness tied to earthly life and prevent them from progressing to higher spheres. In such cases, a medium capable of understanding or acting as a channel for their writing or speech will be of great help. It is important to emphasize that the reason why they cannot write or speak without a medium is that a state of matter can only act upon the immediately inferior state, given that the entity possesses no denser matter in its organism than that which makes up the Kamarupa. So it is impossible to produce vibrations in the physical substance of the air or move a physical pencil without resorting to living matter of the intermediate order contained in the etheric double. In this way, they can easily transfer an impulse from one plane to another. Mediumship by its nature allows for the easy separability of principles within a medium, meaning the entity can effortlessly draw the necessary matter for its manifestation, whatever its nature may be. In cases where it cannot find a medium or does not know how to use one, the entity may sometimes clumsily and disorganizedly attempt to communicate on its own. In these instances, it uses the force of its will to blindly set elemental forces in motion, which can manifest, for example, in stone throwing or seemingly purposeless bell ringing. Therefore, it is common for a medium visiting a house where such manifestations occur to discover what the entity is trying to communicate and thus bring an end to the disturbance. However, this would not always be the case, as elemental forces can also be activated by completely different causes. However, while there are entities bound to Earth by the desire to communicate with their surviving loved ones, there are also countless entities who, if left alone, would never have such intention. However, when this idea is suggested through a medium, they readily respond. During their earthly life, their interests were probably more focused on worldly affairs than spiritual matters, 
which facilitates the reactivation of vibrations linked to the existence they have just left. This undesirable intensification of earthly thoughts is often provoked by well-meaning but ignorant friends who attempt to obtain communications from the deceased through a medium. This can lead to the various dangers mentioned earlier. It is important to note that potential harm to the entity itself is not the only damage that can result from this practice. Those who regularly attend spiritualist sessions during their life are inclined to develop a tendency to attend the same after death, exposing them to the same risks that attracted their predecessors. Furthermore, it is well known that the vital energy necessary to produce physical manifestations is often drawn from both those attending the sessions and the medium themselves. The final effect of mediumship is invariably negative, as evidenced by the large number of mediums who have morally or psychically descended into dire situations. Some may become epileptic, others may fall into alcoholism, and still others may fall under the influence of various forms of fraud and deceit. Even if an individual leads a somewhat less than perfect life, they could achieve a similar outcome if they allow the lower desires forces to act uninterrupted in the Kama Loka. However, most of humanity makes only insignificant and superficial efforts during their time on Earth to free themselves from the lower impulses of their nature. Therefore, they condemn themselves not only to a prolonged stay in the astral plane, but also to what we can describe as a loss of part of the lower manners. The idea of the relationship between the higher and lower manners can be expressed materially, but only those who have undergone initiation can fully understand it, Therefore, we must settle for the most precise approach possible. A useful hypothesis is that the principle of manas sends a part of itself into the lower world of physical life with each incarnation and hopes to withdraw it at the end of life after all its diverse experiences. However, the common man is often lamentably enslaved to all sorts of base desires. Thus, a portion of this lower manas tightly intertwines with the karma and when separation occurs after the end of life in the Kama Luka, the principle of Manas must part from it, leaving it degraded inside the Kamara. The Kamaropa consists of astral matter particles that the lower Manas could not release itself from, thus holding it prisoner. Passing into Dev Bashan, these attached fragments carry a part of it and in some way tear it apart. The proportion of matter from each level present in the Kamaropa will depend on the extent to which the manas has deeply intertwined with the lower passions. It is clear that, since the manas, moving from one level to another, cannot completely free itself from the matter of each, the Kamaropa will show the presence of each type, the coarsest of which has succeeded in maintaining its connection with it. This is how the entity known as the shadow forms. It is important to emphasize that this entity is in no way the true individual, as the latter has passed away into Devachan. However, the shadow not only adopts its exact personal appearance, but also possesses its memory and all its minor peculiarities, allowing it to easily impersonate the deceased, as often occurs during sessions. It is unaware of its deception, as its intellect is limited to believing it is the true individual. Imagine the shock and revulsion the deceased's friends would feel if they realized they were duped into accepting a soulless entity representing only its worst qualities. The lifespan of the shadow varies depending on the amount of lower manas animating it. However, since this aspect is continually diminishing, its intellect also steadily declines. Although it may manifest some animal cunning of certain types, even at the end of its existence, when it is still capable of temporarily communicating through the medium using borrowed intelligence, this entity is highly susceptible to being influenced by malevolent forces as it has separated from its higher self and lacks elements in its constitution capable of responding to good. Consequently, it is easily manipulated to accomplish lower designs by certain low-grade black magicians. Most of the manner-like matter possessed by the shadow gradually disintegrates and returns to its own plane. In this way, the shadow dissolves almost imperceptibly, transforming into a member of the next class of entities. What remains of this entity is simply the astral corpse in a process of disintegration. Every particle of the lower manas has completely abandoned it. It is devoid of consciousness and is passively carried along by astral currents, 
like a cloud that can be carried in any direction by a passing breeze. However, on certain occasions, it may be momentarily animated to represent a horrific caricature of life if it is near the aura of a medium. In these circumstances, it will outwardly resemble its deceased personality, even reproducing to some extent familiar expressions or handwriting. However, this occurs solely due to the automatic action of the cells composing it, which tend to repeat action patterns they are accustomed to when stimulated. Any intelligence it might manifest has no connection with the original entity. Instead, it is borrowed by the medium or their guides for the occasion. However, it is more common for it to be vitalized in another manner, as explained in the following section. Furthermore, the shadow still retains the quality of being blindly sensitive to vibrations, generally of a lower nature, that were established within it during its last stage of existence as a shadow. Therefore, individuals dominated by negative desires or passions are highly likely, when attending physical seances, to find that these negative aspects intensify and are projected onto them by the unconscious envelopes of the shadow. It is also necessary to mention another variety of corpse that belongs to a much earlier stage in man's post-mortem history. As mentioned earlier, after the death of the physical body, the Kamarupa forms relatively quickly and the etheric double separates. This latter body is destined for a slow disintegration similar to the Kama in a later stage of the process. However, this etheric envelope does not remain adrift like the variety we have dealt with so far. On the contrary, it remains a few meters from the decomposing physical body and being easily visible to anyone even slightly sensitive is responsible for many common tales of ghosts in cemeteries. A psychically developed person passing through a large cemetery may see hundreds of these white, blue and nebulous forms fluttering above the graves that have recently received the physical remains of the deceased. These forms are at different stages of disintegration, making the sight unpleasant. Like the other type of shell, it is also completely devoid of consciousness and intelligence. Although it may be momentarily animated in a horrifying form of life in certain circumstances, this is only possible through repugnant rites of black magic, which are better left unexplored. And thus it can be observed that during the successive stages of progress from earthly life to devachan, man sheds and leaves in slow dissolution no fewer than three corpses, the physical body, the etheric double and the kamarupa. All these bodies gradually dissolve into their respective constituent elements and are reused in their respective planes by the wondrous alchemy of nature. Therefore, it is advisable to avoid suicide or being a victim of sudden death. The death of a person who is abruptly removed from physical life while healthy and strong, whether by accident or suicide, places them in the astral plane under very different conditions than those who die of old age or illness. In the latter case, earthly desires have a weaker hold on the entity, and it is likely that the coarsest particles have already been shed, resulting in the formation of the Kamaropa in the sixth or fifth subdivision of Kaloka, or even higher. The principles have been gradually prepared for separation, and the impact is not as overwhelming. However, in the case of accidental deaths or suicides, none of these preparations have been made, and the withdrawal of the principles from their physical envelope is likened to tearing a bone from an immature fruit. A large amount of coarse astral matter still clings to the personality, keeping it in the seventh or lowest subdivision of Calica, an unpleasant region. This subdivision affects those inhabiting it differently. Victims of sudden death with noble earthly lives have no affinity with this plane and spend their time in a state of happiness and forgetfulness or in a peaceful sleep filled with pleasant dreams. In contrast, those whose earthly lives were low, brutal, selfish and sensual, as well as suicides, are fully conscious in this unpleasant region and can become malevolent entities. Deprived of a physical body to satisfy their repugnant appetites, they seek to fulfill them through a medium or any sensitive person they can obsess. They use deceptions and stratagems from the astral plane to incite others into the same excesses that led to their fatal destiny. In ecclesiastical literature, these beings are known as Pisas, Incubi and Succubi. Demons of thirst, gluttony, lust, avarice, intensified cunning, malice and cruelty. These tempting demons, 
seek to induce their victims to commit horrors and delight in doing so. However, their power is ineffective against the purity of spirit and purpose of an individual, as they cannot exert influence unless that person has cultivated within themselves the vices they seek to drag them into. Those with open psychic vision often see crowds of unpleasant creatures lurking around butchers' shops, taverns, and other dishonorable places where they find the gross influences they enjoy, as well as men and women still in the flesh who are like them. Meeting a medium with whom they have affinity is a terrible misfortune for these entities, as it allows them to greatly prolong their terrifying existence in Kalika and renew their power to generate evil karma, which may prepare them for a future incarnation with an even unhappier character. Moreover, they risk losing a large part, if not all, of the lower mana at this lower level of the astral plane. They must remain there for at least as long as their earthly life would have lasted if it had not been prematurely interrupted. If they are fortunate enough not to encounter a medium through whom they can satisfy their unfulfilled desires vicariously, they will gradually consume themselves. The suffering caused in the process contributes to working off the evil karma of their past life. The position of the suicide is even more complicated, as their reckless act has significantly diminished the power of the higher ego to fold their lower part into themselves, thereby exposing them to multiple and great additional dangers. However, it is important to note that the guilt of suicide varies depending on the circumstances from morally irreproachable acts to heinous crimes. It is important to emphasize that this class, like energized shadows and shells, are what we might call minor vampires, as they seek to prolong their existence by draining the vitality of the human beings they can influence. This is why the medium, as well as mediums, often feel weak and exhausted after a physical seance. Students of occultism learn to protect themselves from their attempts, but without this knowledge it is difficult for those who cross their path to avoid being subjected to them to some extent. In addition to the vampire and werewolf, there are two even more terrifying possibilities, but fortunately very rare ones that I must mention before concluding this part of our subject. Although they differ in many ways, they can be grouped together due to their shared characteristics of supernatural terror and extreme rarity attributable to their origin as relics of earlier races. We, as representatives of the fifth race, should have evolved beyond facing such a terrifying fate as indicated by either of these two subsections, and to a large extent we have. These creatures are now considered mere medieval fables, although they are still occasionally found especially in countries with a significant influence from the fourth race, like Russia or Hungary. Although the popular legends about them may be exaggerated in many cases, there is a chilling substratum of truth behind the stories circulating among the peasants of Central Europe. The general characteristics of these stories are well known, and we will only need to make a brief reference to them. A typical example of a vampire story is Sheridan Le Fanu's Carmilla, while a remarkable narrative of an unusual variant of this creature is found in Isis. Readers familiar with theosophical literature will know of the idea that a person can fall into a life that is completely degraded and selfish, so perverse and brutal that their lower nature is completely submerged and ultimately separated from its spiritual source in the higher ego. Some believe that such soulless individuals are common, but this is a mistake, because to achieve such malice all traces of altruism or spirituality must be suppressed, and no point of redemption must be present. Although these abandoned personalities are a minority, they do exist. It is among them that vampires are born, who are even rarer. When the lost entity quickly dies, it finds itself unable to remain in a coma, and is consciously and irresistibly drawn towards its own place, the mysterious eighth sphere, where it slowly disintegrates, after experiencing experiences that are better left undescribed. However, if someone dies by suicide or sudden death, they may avoid this horrible fate, especially if linked to black magic. By becoming a vampire, they enter a barely less terrifying existence, as the eighth sphere can only claim the individual after the death of the body. They maintain this catatonic state by the horrific method of blood transfusion extracted from other human beings through their sepulchral chamber. In this way, 
the vampire postpones its final destiny by committing large-scale murders, as popular superstition suggests. The most effective remedy in such cases is to exhume and burn the body, thereby depriving the creature of its foothold. Upon opening the tomb, the body often appears relatively fresh and healthy, and it is not uncommon to find the coffin filled with blood. It is important to mention that this type of vampirism is impossible in countries where cremation is a common practice. The werewolf, though equally terrifying, is the result of somewhat different karma and could indeed have been included in the first division rather than the second of the human inhabitants of Kaloka, as it always manifests for the first time during a person's life. This invariably involves some knowledge of magical arts, at least sufficient to project the astral body. When a completely cruel and brutal man achieves this, there are circumstances where the body can be taken over by other astral entities and materialized, not in human form, but as a wild animal. Typically, a wolf. In this state, the werewolf roams the surrounding countryside, killing other animals and even humans, thus satisfying not only its own thirst for blood, but also that of the demons that drive it. In this case, as often happens with the ordinary astral body, any injury inflicted on the materialization of the animal will occur on the human physical body through the extraordinary phenomenon of repercussion. However, after the death of this physical body, the Camaropa, which will likely continue to appear in the same form, will be less vulnerable. Nevertheless, it will also be less dangerous, as without a suitable means, it cannot fully materialize. Throughout this century, there has been a tendency to mock what is considered the naive superstitions of ignorant peasants. However, as in previous cases and many others, the occultist discovers upon close examination that behind what appears to be pure madness at first glance lie forgotten or obscured truths of nature. Therefore, one learns to be cautious in both rejection and acceptance. Aspiring explorers of the astral plane need not fear encountering the unpleasant creatures described in this chapter, because, as mentioned earlier, they are very rare nowadays and their numbers will diminish over time. Moreover, their manifestations are generally limited to the immediate vicinity of their physical bodies, as one would expect due to their extremely material nature. 9. The Black Mage or Their Disciple this person is at the opposite end of the scale compared to our second class of deceased entities, the Chela, who awaits reincarnation. In this case, instead of obtaining permission to follow an unusual method of progression, the individual defies the natural process of evolution by remaining on the astral plane through the use of magical practices, sometimes the most horrible. We could subdivide this class into several categories according to their goals, methods, and possible duration of existence on this plane. However, since they are not fascinating subjects for study, and all that an occult student wants to know about them is how to avoid them, it will be more interesting to move on to examine another part of our subject. Nevertheless, it is worth mentioning that any human entity extending their life on the astral plane beyond its natural limit always does so at the expense of others, absorbing the life of other forms in one way or another. 10. The Non-Humans Although it was quite obvious even to the most casual observer that many natural structures that closely affect us were not designed exclusively for our comfort or benefit, humanity, especially in its early stages, was inevitably inclined to imagine that the world and everything in it existed solely for its own profit. However, by this stage, we should have outgrown this childish illusion and recognized our position and responsibilities. Unfortunately, evidence still persists of this lack of awareness in our daily lives, especially in the cruel manner in which many civilized people treat animals in the name of sport. On the path of occultism, one learns that all life is sacred and that true progress comes from universal compassion. As understanding deepens, one discovers the diversity of evolution and the relatively small role humanity plays in nature. One also realizes that, just as the earth, air and water harbour countless forms of life invisible to the naked eye but revealed by the microscope, the higher planes connected to our world also host a dense population of which we are generally unaware. As understanding deepens, one realises that every possibility of evolution is exploited in one way or another, and our perception that nature wastes or neglects a force or opportunity 
stems from our ignorance of its method and intention, not from a flaw in the universe's design. While others follow completely different evolutionary lines, before considering these classes, it is important to mention two reservations to avoid being accused of being incomplete on this subject. First, we do not refer to the occasional appearances of highly advanced beings such as the high initiates from other planets of the solar system or even higher visitors from distant places as adequately describing such subjects is beyond the scope of this essay intended for general reading. Moreover, it is practically inconceivable, though theoretically possible, that these glorified beings would need to manifest on the astral plane as low compared to their level of existence. If they ever did, for whatever reason, they would temporarily create a suitable body for the astral plane from the astral matter of this planet, similar to the case of the Nirmanakaya. Second, apart from the four we have identified in this section, there are two other major evolutions currently sharing the use of this planet with humanity. However, due to certain circumstances, we will not provide details about them at the moment, as apparently neither are meant to be aware of our existence nor are we of theirs under ordinary circumstances. If we ever come into contact with them, it is very likely to be on the physical plane as their connection to our astral plane is minimal. The possibility of them appearing on the astral plane would depend on an extremely unlikely accident in a ceremonial magic act known only to a few advanced sorcerers. Although improbable, it has occurred at least once and could recur. Therefore, we will respect the aforementioned prohibition and not include it in our list this time. 1. The Elemental Essence Belonging to Our Own Evolution The term elemental has been ambiguously used by several writers, applying it to any or all possible post-mortem conditions of the human being. It has also been used at different times to refer to all non-human spirits, from the most divine devas, to the formless essence pervading pre-mineral realms. This variety of meanings has led to contradictory claims on the subject, confusing the student who reads different books on this topic. To simplify matters in this treatise, we will limit ourselves to considering the latter mentioned use of the term, applying it only to the three great realms that precede the mineral in our evolutionary process. Let us recall that an early letter from an initiated master refers to these elemental realms and asserts that the first and second can only be understood by an initiate. Fortunately, this complex part of the vast subject will not be addressed in this manual, as these first and second elemental realms exist and function at the Arupa and Rupa levels of the Bannock plane, which is beyond the scope of this discussion for now. We focus solely on the third realm, which precedes the mineral in our evolutionary process. However, even this realm is quite complex, as it contains over 2,400 perfectly distinct varieties of elemental essence. Each of these varieties requires the disciple seeking to master astral forces to recognize them instantly on sight and learn to manipulate them with their specific method, as each is unique and cannot be handled with the same techniques as others. It is true that various phenomena can be produced by those who can manipulate only one or two of these forces, but the adept prefers to take the extra time to deeply understand them all. In this way, they can use the most appropriate force or combination of forces in each case, achieving their goal precisely and scientifically, using the least amount of energy possible. Speaking of an elemental in relation to the group we are now considering, can be misleading because, strictly speaking, such an entity does not truly exist. We find a vast repository of elemental essence extremely responsive to fleeting thoughts of the human being. This essence responds with incredible delicacy and immediacy to vibrations caused even by unconscious impulses of will or desire. When this thought or exercise of will influences enough to shape this essence into a living force, we can accurately describe this result as an elemental. However, at that point, the elemental ceases to belong to the category we were considering and becomes a member of the artificial class. Nevertheless, its existence as a separate entity is generally ephemeral, as once its impulse is exhausted, it reintegrates into the undifferentiated mass from which it originated. Listing all subdivisions of this elemental essence would be tedious and hardly comprehensible, 
except for the practical student who studies and compares them. However, we can easily understand the main lines of classification. The first classification is related to the type of matter they inhabit, and here reflects the septenary character of our evolution. There are seven main groups linked to the seven states of physical matter, earth, water, air, and fire, which in modern terms would be the solid, liquid, gaseous, and ethereal conditions. Historically, alchemists of the Middle Ages were criticized for their concept of elements, which in modern chemistry have been demonstrated as compound substances. However, this disdain is unfair. The alchemists possessed a deeper understanding of the matter. They understood that true elementality, the very Akasha, existed, of which all other forms of matter were mere modifications. In fact, some of the great contemporary chemists are beginning to suspect this same truth. In this particular case, we must acknowledge that the analysis performed by our disparaged ancestors was considerably deeper than ours. They not only understood ether, but could also observe it, whereas modern science can only posit its existence as a necessity for its theories. Furthermore, they were aware that ether consisted of physical matter in four completely different states above the gaseous state, a fact we have not yet rediscovered. They understood that all physical objects were composed of matter in one or another of these seven states, and that every organic body contained to a greater or lesser extent these seven states. Hence they used the term elements to refer to constituent parts without intending to suggest they were indivisible substances. Their language with discussions of fiery and aqueous humours may seem grotesque to us today, but in reality, this terminology referred to the composition of matter in different states. Moreover, our ancestors knew that each of these orders of matter served as an upadi or base of manifestation for a large class of evolving monadic essence, and this is why they called this elemental essence. What we must understand is that every particle of solid matter contains, as the medieval students said, an earth elemental, as long as it remains in that condition. Similarly, in every particle of matter in the liquid, gaseous, or ethereal state, respectively, reside the elementals of water, air, and fire. This primary division of the elemental kingdom presents itself horizontally with related classes in a stair-like system, each less material than the previous, in almost imperceptible degrees. We can easily understand that each of these classes can also be horizontally subdivided into seven due to the multiple degrees between solids, liquids, and gases. However, there exists a perpendicular division that is more difficult to grasp, because occultists keep a great secret about some of the involved facts. In a more complete explanation, we can state that within each horizontal class and subclass, there exist seven perfectly distinct types of elementals, differing not only in their degree of materiality, but also in their character and affinities. Each type reacts uniquely with others, and although they can never exchange their essence, within each type there are seven subtypes differentiated by the influence that most easily affects them. It is important to emphasize that this perpendicular division and subdivision differs completely from the horizontal division being much more permanent and fundamental. While the evolution of the elemental kingdom progresses slowly through its different horizontal classes and subclasses and belongs to each in turn, the types and subtypes remain immutable over time. A crucial aspect in understanding this elemental evolution is that it occurs in what is called the descending arc of the curve. Instead of moving away from matter as in most other known evolutions, it progresses towards a greater involvement in it, as observed in the mineral kingdom. This may seem curious and reversed until we fully understand its purpose. Despite the multiple subdivisions, all varieties of this strange living essence possess certain common properties. However, these properties are so different from what we know in the physical plane that it is extremely difficult to explain them to those who cannot observe them in action. Imagine that when a portion of this essence belongs for a moment, without being affected by any external influence, a condition that rarely occurs, it lacks its own form. Although its movement is rapid and incessant, as soon as the slightest disturbance is caused, perhaps by a fleeting thought, it transforms into a confusing muddle of agitated and changing forms 
that appear, rush and disappear as quickly as bubbles in boiling water. These ephemeral forms, although they often represent living creatures, human or otherwise, do not express the existence of distinct entities within the essence. They rather seem to be simple reflections of the vast reservoir of astral light. However, they often bear some resemblance to the character of the stream of thought that calls them into existence, albeit sometimes with a certain grotesque distortion or unpleasant appearance. This raises a question of what intelligence is exercised in the selection or distortion of an appropriate form. This is not the most powerful artificial elemental created by strong and defined thought, but simply the result produced by semi-conscious and involuntary currents of thought circulating in the minds of most of humanity. Intelligence does not seem to derive from the thinker's mind, nor can we attribute this quality to the elemental essence itself, as it belongs to a realm farther from individualization. Even in the mineral, however, this essence possesses a wonderful adaptability resembling intelligence to some extent, which has led to describing elementals as semi-entities. The latter do not admit conceptions such as good and evil, although there are tendencies that make them more hostile than friendly towards humans. Any neophyte who has explored the astral plane knows that they are often surrounded by threatening protean spectres that dissipate harmlessly if confronted with courage. This curious tendency may explain the distortion or unpleasant aspect mentioned earlier. According to medieval writers, man must blame himself for the existence of hostile elementals in a previous golden age, when men were less selfish and more spiritual and elementals were friendly. But due to man's indifference and lack of empathy towards other living beings, they adopted less friendly characteristics. The elemental essence, due to its incredible sensitivity to the slightest action of our thoughts or desires, seems to be largely a product of humanity's collective thought. Given the current state of collective thought, it is not surprising that we reap unfriendly results. However, it is possible that in future races or cycles, when humanity has evolved to a higher level, the elemental kingdoms will be influenced by higher thought and will no longer be hostile but docile and helpful, just as we are told will be the animal kingdom. Regardless of what has happened in the past, there seems to be a glimmer of hope for a golden age in the future, if the majority of men manage to be noble and selfless, and if the forces of nature cooperate harmoniously with them. The influence we exert on the elemental kingdoms clearly shows that we have a responsibility towards them in how we use this influence. Indeed, the effect of our thoughts and desires on these living essences has been considered a factor in their evolution within the scheme of our system. Despite the consistent teachings of all the great religions, most of humanity remains indifferent to its responsibility in the realm of thought. Many believe that if their words and actions have not been harmful to others, they have accomplished all that can be asked of them. However, they are unaware that for years they may have exerted a reducing and degrading influence on the minds of those around them, filling the surrounding space with unpleasant creations from a lower mind. The subject becomes even more serious when we consider the topic of the artificial elemental, which we will address at another time. For now, it suffices to say that we have the power to accelerate or delay the evolution of elemental essence based on the conscious or unconscious use we constantly make of it. Within the scope of this treatise, it would be pointless to try to explain the various uses that a person trained in manipulating the forces inherent in these multiple varieties of elemental essence could achieve. Many magical ceremonies depend almost entirely on the manipulation of these forces, whether directly by the will of the mage or through astral entities evoked for this purpose. Through these essences, almost all physical phenomena of seances are produced, as well as the throwing of stones or the sound of bells in haunted houses. These results are due to misguided efforts to attract the attention of an earthly entity or the antics of minor spirits of nature. However, it is important to note that the elemental should not be considered the primary driver behind these phenomena. It is simply a latent force that requires an external power to set it in motion. We observe that while all classes of essence may reflect images of astral light, there are varieties that receive certain impressions more easily than others and have preferred forms towards which they naturally gravitate in case of disturbance. Unless forced to adopt another form, 
These forms tend to be somewhat less ephemeral than others. It is important to clarify the difference between the elemental essence we have considered and the monadic essence that manifests through the mineral kingdom. The monadic essence in its evolution towards humanity first manifests through the elemental kingdom and at a later stage through the mineral kingdom. However, the fact that two bodies of monadic essence at these different stages are in manifestation at the same time and occupy the same space, for example an earth elemental and a rock, implies no relationship or interference in the evolution of either. In this context we must understand that elemental essence and monadic essence are completely distinct and separate entities. The presence of the earth elemental in an area inhabited by a rock does not mean that there is any direct connection or relationship between the monadic essences. Each follows its own evolutionary course independently of the other. It is also relevant to mention that the rock is also imbued with its own variety of the omnipresent jiva, or vital principle, which is once again completely different from either of the aforementioned essences. These essences have their own unique characteristics and functions in creation, and although they can coexist in the same space, they remain distinct entities and do not interfere with each other in their respective evolutionary processes. Some domestic animals have achieved individuality, which means they will no longer reincarnate as animals in this world. For them, life in the animal kingdom is the longest and most experienced compared to their less developed companions. At the end of this experience, they gradually immerse themselves in a subjective state that can last a significant period. An interesting subdivision within this category concerns the companions of the great anthropoid apes mentioned in the secret doctrine. These apes are already individualized and will be ready to incarnate as human beings in the next cycle or even before. Spirits of nature of all kinds present such a vast variety of subdivisions that it would require a dedicated treatise solely for their study to be properly addressed. Nevertheless, they all share certain common characteristics, and I will attempt to provide a general overview. It is essential to understand that we are dealing with entities radically different from anything we have considered so far. While we can rightly classify elemental science and the animal kingdom as non-human, the monadic essence that manifests through them will evolve over time to reach a level comparable to that of future humanity, similar to our own. However, this does not apply to the vast realm of nature spirits. They have never been and will never be members of a humanity like ours. Their line of evolution is completely different, and their only connection with us lies in the fact that we temporarily share the same planet. Of course, as neighbors for the moment, we owe each other the typical courtesy of neighbors when we meet. However, our lines of development are so different that each has a limited impact on the other. Many writers have classified these spirits as elementals, and indeed, they represent a higher evolution of these, or perhaps a higher evolution of animals. Although they are considerably more developed than our elemental essence, they share some common characteristics with it. These spirits are divided into seven major classes, each inhabiting the same seven states of matter as those mentioned earlier, imbued with corresponding varieties of essence. To facilitate our understanding, we can identify the spirits that reside and function in the most familiar environments to us, spirits of the earth, water, air, and fire, or ether. These defined intelligent astral entities inhabit each of these elements. We might wonder how it is possible for a creature to reside in the solid substance of a rock or the earth's crust. The answer is that, since nature spirits are formed of astral matter, solid substance presents no obstacle to their movement or vision. Furthermore, physical matter in its solid state is their natural element, the only one they are accustomed to and where they feel at home. The same applies to those inhabiting water, air or ether. Historically, in medieval literature, these earth spirits were called gnomes, those of water were called undines, those of air were called sylphs, and those of ether were called salamanders. In popular language, they are known by many names, sprites, elves, brownies, fairies, trolls, satyrs, fauns, kobolds, imps, goblins, and so on. Some of these titles apply to specific varieties, while others are used interchangeably for all. 
These spirits adopt a wide variety of forms, although it is common for them to have a human-like form and somewhat reduced size. Like most inhabitants of the astral plane, they have the ability to assume any appearance at will. While they undeniably have defined forms or preferred forms that they often adopt when they have no specific reason to take another appearance. Of course, under normal conditions, they are not visible to the naked eye, but they have the power to materialize at will. Among nature spirits, there are countless subdivisions or races, and just like humans, individuals in these subdivisions vary in intelligence and disposition. Most of them seem to prefer avoiding contact with humans, as they find their habits and emanations unpleasant. However, there are also cases where nature spirits have formed friendships with human beings and provided them with assistance, as in the well-known stories of Scottish brownies or firelighting fairies mentioned in spiritual literature. However, such helpful behaviour is relatively rare. In most encounters with humans, nature spirits show indifference, antipathy, or enjoy deceiving them and playing tricks on them. Illustrative of this curious characteristic are the accounts of peasants from various solitary mountainous regions, as well as those who have attended spiritism sessions for physical phenomena, who will also recall cases of practical jokes and harmless pranks that indicate the presence of lower orders of nature spirits. These spirits are skilled in their tricks due to their astonishing power to dazzle those who fall under their influence. These victims see and hear only what the fairies transmit to them, similar to a hypnotized subject who sees, hears, feels and believes what the hypnotist wishes. However, nature spirits cannot dominate human will, except in the case of very weak-minded individuals, or those who fall into a state of helpless terror where their will is temporarily suspended. Though they cannot influence beyond deception, they are true masters in this art and have managed to enchant a considerable number of people simultaneously. Some Indian jugglers have invoked their help to perform astonishing feats, hallucinating the entire audience and making them believe they are witnessing a series of events that never actually took place. We might consider nature spirits as a kind of astral humanity, albeit with a significant difference. None of them, even the highest, possess a permanent individuality. They apparently reincarnate. Their line of evolution differs from ours in that they develop a higher proportion of intelligence. Before permanent individualization occurs, however, the stages they have passed through and those they have yet to traverse are largely unknown to us. The lifespans of different subdivisions of these spirits vary considerably, some being short and others much longer than human life. Their existence seems to be of a simple, joyful and carefree nature, like that of a group of happy children in an exceptionally favorable physical environment. Though mischievous and playful, they are rarely malicious unless provoked or unjustly disturbed. However, they also share a general distrust of humans and tend to find the presence of a neophyte in the astral plane unpleasant or frightening. Yet, if not frightened by their appearances and phenomena, nature spirits will eventually accept them, and some may even become friendly and show pleasure in getting to know them, some subdivisions of this class are more dignified and less childlike than those described earlier. Indeed, it is from these sections that entities have sometimes been revered as forest gods or local deities of the people. These entities are aware of the implicit worship in the reverence shown to them, benefit from it, and are willing to offer small services in return. The adept who is skilled in occultism knows how to use the services of nature spirits when needed. However, an ordinary mage can only obtain their help through processes of invocation or evocation, that is, by attracting their attention as a supplicant and reaching an agreement with them, or by attempting to exert influences that compel them to obey. Both methods are highly undesirable, and the latter is extremely dangerous as the mage could provoke determined hostility that could prove fatal to them. Therefore, no student of occultism under the guidance of a qualified master, would be allowed to attempt such practices. The devas, the highest system of earth-related evolution, are, according to our knowledge, beings that Hindus call devas, sometimes also known as angels or sons of God. We can consider them as a realm situated immediately above humanity, in the same way that humanity is above the animal kingdom. However, there is a difference. 
while an animal has no possibility of evolving beyond the human realm, the human being, once reaching a high level, finds various paths of advancement open to them, with the evolution of DEA being one. Compared to the sublime renunciation of the Nirmanakaya, the choice to follow this evolutionary line is sometimes described in books as succumbing to the temptation to become God. However, we must not interpret this expression as an accusation of guilt against those who make this choice. The path they choose is not the shortest, but it is noble, and if they are drawn to it by their developed intuition, it is likely the best suited to their capabilities. It is essential to remember that in spiritual pursuit, just as in physics, not everyone can endure the effort of the steepest path. For many, what seems the slowest path is the only feasible one. We would be unworthy disciples of the great masters if we were to scorn those whose choice differs from ours. Our ignorance of future difficulties prevents us from asserting what we will be capable of when, after many lives of patient struggle, we have the right to choose our own future. Even those who succumb to the temptation to become gods have before them a sufficiently glorious career, as will be explained later. It is important to mention to avoid misunderstandings that in some books the phrase to become a god is attributed to a completely perverse sense. However, in this way, it could never be a temptation for the developed human, and in any case, it is completely foreign to our current subject. In Eastern literature, the word deva is used broadly and vaguely to refer to almost any type of non-human entity, which includes both deities, nature spirits, and artificial elementals. However, in this context, we will limit ourselves to considering their magnificent evolution. Although devas are linked to earth, they are not restricted to it, as our entire current chain of seven worlds is but one world to them, and their evolution spans through a grand system of seven chains. So far, most of their ranks have been recruited from other humanities of the solar system, some being lower and others more advanced than ours. Only a small part of our humanity has reached the level where joining them is possible. However, it seems likely that some of the numerous classes of divas have not passed through a humanity comparable to ours in their upward progression. While we may not fully understand this at present, it is clear that their evolutionary goal is significantly higher than ours, whereas our human evolution aims to elevate the successful portion of humanity to a certain degree of development hidden at the end of the seventh round. The aim of Diva evolution is to elevate their higher ranks to a much higher level in the corresponding period for them. Just as for us, there is a shorter but steeper path leading to even more sublime heights. Regarding the astral plane, it is relevant to mention the lower band of this celestial body. Its three major lower divisions, starting from the base, are generally called Kamadevas, Rupadevas and Arupadevas respectively. The Kamadeva, similar to our physical body here on Earth, corresponds to the astral body of this plane. Living ordinarily in an astral body places one in a position that humanity would have on planet F. Just as we might project ourselves to higher spheres in a Maya Virupa, an adept could do the same with their astral body, and when sufficiently developed, enter the Karana Sharira, which would not be a major effort for them, just as forming a Maya Virupa would be for us. In contrast, the Rupa Deva would dwell in the four lower levels or Rupa of the spiritual plane known as Devachan, so their ordinary body would be the Maya Virupa. The Arupa Deva belongs to the three upper levels of this plane and has no more approach to a body than the Karana Sharira. However, these manifestations of Rupa and Arupa Devas on the astral plane are rare events, just as the materialization of astral entities on the physical plane, so we will only briefly mention them. It is a mistake to think that all Kamadevas are incomparably superior to us. Some of them have joined their ranks from a humanity that is in some respects less advanced than ours, although their overall average is much higher than ours, as they have eliminated any malevolent activity from their ranks, they differ considerably in disposition. A noble, altruistic and spiritually minded human may be at a higher stage of evolution than some Kamadevas. Although they may be attracted to certain magical evocations, only some adepts of a high class can dominate their will. In general, they seem hardly aware of us on the physical plane. However, from time to time, 
one of them may perceive a human difficulty that awakens their compassion and offer assistance in a manner similar to how we would help a distressed animal. However, it is well established among them that intervening in human affairs at present could cause more harm than good. Above the Arupa Devas, there are four other major divisions. Beyond the realm of the Devas are the great troops of the Dian Kohan. However, considering these glorified beings would be out of place in an essay on the astral plane. At this stage, it is appropriate to mention the wonderful and significant beings known as the Four of Baraja. However, the word Deva here does not refer to the Deva realm mentioned earlier, but to the four elements of earth, water, air and fire, as well as their natural spirits and essences, residing over which these four kings govern their evolution. The Debraj have domain over the elements that compose this double etheric and adjust their proportions so that karma is fulfilled precisely. They constantly monitor throughout life to counter changes introduced in man's condition by his own will and that of those around him, ensuring that no injustice is committed and that karma is fulfilled in any way. Although they act through the higher spirits of nature and troops of artificial elementals, all responsibility rests on them. These beings can take human material forms at will, and there have been several records of their manifestations. Although it is not common for them to manifest on the astral plane, when they do, they are undoubtedly the most remarkable non-human inhabitants. Meanwhile, a third category may include the small number of artificially created entities that are not elementals at all. As explained earlier, the elemental essence that surrounds us in all its countless varieties is particularly receptive to the influence of human thought. We have seen how mere wandering thoughts can provoke this essence to transform into a cloud of evanescent moving forms. Now, we will observe how this essence reacts when the human mind formulates a definite and resolute thought or desire. The resulting effect is surprising. The thought seizes the plastic essence and instantly molds it into a suitable living being. A being that once created completely escapes the control of its creator and acquires its own life. Its duration is directly related to the intensity of the thought or desire that engendered it, as it persists as long as the force of the thought keeps it united. The fleeting and indecisive thoughts of most people give rise to elementals that last only a few minutes or hours. However, frequent thoughts or fervent desires engender elementals whose existence can extend for many days. These elementals tend to flutter around the thinker, seeking to provoke the repetition of the idea they represent. These repetitions strengthen the elemental and give it a new vital impulse. Thus, desire can be harmful. The effect on the moral nature of the individual can be disastrous. For example, if someone frequently harbors a negative desire, they could create an astral companion who, constantly fueled by new negative thoughts, will pursue them for years, exerting increasing influence over them. Thoughts directed towards other people also have significant consequences, as they do not focus on the thinker, but on the object of the thought. A benevolent thought or sincere desire for good towards someone forms and projects a friendly artificial elemental towards that person. If the desire is specific, such as wishing for their recovery from an illness, the elemental will act as a force promoting their healing and warding off negative influences. Although it seems to have considerable influence, it actually follows the path of least resistance and takes advantage of any opportunity to manifest, much like water in a cistern flows through the open pipe rather than the closed ones. Even if the desire is indefinite in nature, the elemental essence will respond to this less defined idea and the elemental will act in the individual's interest according to what is most accessible. In all cases, the amount of force the elemental expends and its lifespan depend entirely on the intensity of the original thought or desire that created it. However, it is important to remember that it can be reinforced and its life prolonged by other good thoughts or friendly desires projected in the same direction. Furthermore, like most beings, this elemental seems driven by an instinct to prolong its life and acts as a force constantly seeking to revive the sentiment that engendered it. Similarly, it influences other beings with whom it comes into contact, even if its relationship with them is not as complete. All that has been mentioned previously about the flaws of good thoughts and friendly thoughts 
applies equally in reverse to bad thoughts and angry thoughts. Given the amount of envy, hatred, malice, and lack of charity that exists in the world, it is easy to understand that among artificial elementals there are many terrifying creatures. A person whose thoughts and desires are resentful, brutal, sensual, or greedy creates around them a pestilential atmosphere populated by repugnant creatures they have engendered to be their companions. Thus, not only does one find oneself in a sadly detrimental situation for oneself, but one also becomes a dangerous nuisance to those unlucky enough to interact with them, as they run the risk of moral contamination from the influence of these abominations with which they have surrounded themselves. An envious, jealous, or hateful feeling directed towards another person will create an evil elemental that hovers over them and seeks vulnerability through which it can act. If the feeling persists, this creature can be continually nourished and thus maintain its undesirable activity for a long period. However, for the elemental to have any effect on the person it is directed at, the latter must have a certain disposition that allows them to be influenced, meaning they must provide a foothold for its influence in the individual's aura. With pure thoughts and a virtuous life, these malign influences are immediately repelled as they find nothing to cling to. Curiously, these malign influences then react with all their force on their original creator. They find a very refined sphere of action within them, and thus the karma of their bad desire acts swiftly through the same entity they summoned into existence. Occasionally, for various reasons, an artificial elemental of this nature is unable to expend its force on its target or its creator, thereby becoming a kind of wandering demon. It is easily attracted to anyone who engages in feelings similar to those that brought it forth and is ready to stimulate such feelings in that person, whether by gaining strength from them or exerting its influence through any opening it finds. If powerful enough to seize a passing shell, its temporary possession allows it to cultivate its terrifying resources more cautiously. In this way, it can manifest through a medium and pass itself off as a known friend. Sometimes, it manages to influence individuals who would otherwise be immune to its power. What has been previously discussed reinforces the importance of maintaining strict control over our thoughts. Many well-intentioned people who strive to fulfill their duty to others through words and actions often neglect the importance of their thoughts, considering them something private that affects no one else. However, unknowingly, they release swarms of evil creatures into the world through their negative thoughts. For someone like this, understanding the effect of thoughts and desires in creating artificial elementals would be a terrifying revelation. On the other hand, it would be a great comfort to dedicated and grateful souls who feel powerless to return the kindness they receive from their benefactors. Friendly thoughts and sincere good wishes are also powerful when they come from humble or wealthy people. Any individual, if they take the trouble, can practically maintain a guardian angel always near those they love and who are in the world. Often, a mother's loving thoughts and prayers turn into a guardian angel for her child, offering help and protection whenever the child shows an inclination that responds to a good influence. These guardians are often perceptible through clairvoyance, and sometimes one of them has had sufficient strength to materialize and become temporarily visible to physical sight. Even after the mother has passed into the post-mortem state, according to Theosophy, the love she poured on her still-living children will resonate within them and support the guardian elemental she created during her time on Earth until her loved ones also pass away. The power of a sincere desire, especially if frequently repeated, to create an active elemental that constantly pursues its own fulfillment scientifically explains what pious but non-philosophical people describe as answers to prayer. While in rare instances, the karma of a praying person may allow an adept or disciple to provide direct assistance, or there exists the even rarer possibility of intervention by a friendly diva or nature spirit. In most cases, the simplest and most obvious way to receive help would be the strengthening and intelligent direction of the elemental already formed by the desire. A curious and instructive case of the persistence of these artificial beings in favorable situations recently caught the attention of one of our researchers. As many listeners know, in the literature on this subject, 
there are ancient families that are supposed to be linked to a traditional omen of death. This phenomenon, which predicts the death of the family head a few days in advance, has been recounted in various ways over time. For example, there is the famous story of the White Bird of Oxenham, whose appearance has been associated for centuries with the death of a family member. Another story speaks of a spectral carriage that is supposed to arrive at the door of a castle in the north when a similar calamity is imminent. Among all these stories is the lesser known but equally impressive phenomenon that affects the family of one of our members. A solemn and mysterious melody resembling a funeral dirge which hangs in the air three days before the death. Our member, having witnessed this melody on two occasions and verifying its accuracy both times, decided to investigate the cause of this strange event. According to family tradition, this phenomenon had been occurring for several centuries. After investigating through occult methods, the result was surprising and fascinating. Apparently, in the 11th century, a brave crusader, head of the family, set out for the Holy Land, taking with him his youngest son, Faoro, a promising young man. Unfortunately, the young man died in battle, plunging his father into deep despair. He mourned not only the loss of his son, but also the fact that his departure had been so premature, leaving behind an immature youth not entirely blameless. Tormented by these feelings, the old man abandoned his life as a knight and joined a monastic order. In his devotion to prayer, the father ardently sought to spare his descendants from the danger of sudden death. Day after day, for many years, he focused all his energy on this desire. An occult student would easily understand the effect that this defined and prolonged current of thought would have. The night monk created an artificial elemental of immense power and ingenuity, intended to fulfill his purpose, accumulating a reserve of strength that would allow it to continue to act for an indefinite duration. An elemental is like a perfect storage battery, with very little energy loss, given the original strength conferred upon it and the small amount it had to use. Therefore, it is not surprising that to this day, this elemental retains its vitality intact and continues to warn the direct descendants of the ancient crusader of their imminent fate through the strange music of lamentation which was the grief of a young and brave soldier 700 years ago in Palestine. This artificial being pursues its ancient purpose with unwavering persistence. Secondly, elementals are consciously formed. The achievement of results such as those mentioned previously, by the power of thought of people who were in total ignorance of their actions, suggests that a mage who understands the subject and clearly sees the effect they generate could wield immense power in this regard. Both white and black school occultists frequently use artificial elementals in their work, and few tasks are beyond the reach of these creatures when scientifically prepared and directed with knowledge and skill. Anyone who knows how can maintain a connection with their elemental and guide it without concern for distance so that it acts practically as if possessing all the intelligence of its creator. In some cases, very defined and effective guardians have been provided through this means. However, karma likely limits interference in a person's life to a decided extent. Although in the case of disciples of the adept who work for them, they may face forces against which their individual strength would be insufficient. Guardians of this description have been granted to them. These guardians have shown their constant vigilance and immense power. On the other hand, through advanced processes of black magic, artificially powerful elementals can also be created, and much harm has been caused by these entities on many occasions. However, as in the previous case, if these entities are directed towards a person of pure character and immune to their influence, they will react with terrible force on their creator. Thus the ancient medieval tale of the magician, torn apart by the demons he himself created, is not a mere fable, but may have a terrible, real basis. Sometimes these creatures escape the control of those who try to use them for various reasons, becoming wandering and purposeless demons, like some mentioned in the previous episode, in similar situations. However, the writings we consider, due to their superior intelligence, power and longevity, are proportionately more dangerous. They constantly seek ways to prolong their lives, feeding like vampires on human vitality or influencing to be offered sacrifices. 
Sometimes, in simple and wild tribes, they managed to be recognized as gods of the people or family through clever manipulations. These deities that demand sacrifices involving blood are considered the lowest and most repugnant class of this order, and other less objectionable entities sometimes settle for offerings of rice and cooked food. In certain parts of India, both varieties can be found thriving today, through the food they obtain from offerings, and even more through the vitality extracted from their devotees, they extend their existence for many years, even centuries, retaining enough strength to occasionally perform light phenomena to stimulate the faith and zeal of their followers. Moreover, they always become unpleasant in any way if the usual sacrifices are neglected. For instance, it has recently been claimed that in an Indian village, when the local deity did not receive its regular meals for some reason, alarming spontaneous suicides occurred between the huts, sometimes three or four at a time in cases where human action could not be suspected. Other stories of similar nature would come to mind for any listener familiar with the remote corners of this astonishing country. The art of creating artificially virulent and powerful elementals seems to have been a specialty of the mages of Atlantis, known as the Lords of the Dark Face. An example of their abilities is mentioned in The Secret Doctrine, where it is related about the marvellous speaking animals that had to be appeased with blood to avoid awakening their masters and warning them of impending destruction. These mages also created other artificial entities of such enormous power and energy that it is obscurely suggested that some of them have disturbed even to this day. Despite more than 11,000 years having passed since the cataclysm that destroyed their original masters, the terrible Indian goddess whose followers were driven to commit the terrible crimes of Tuje, the dreadful Kali, venerated even today with rituals too abominable to be described, might be a relic of a system that had to be eradicated, even at the cost of the submergence of a continent and the loss of 65 million human lives. Three human artificial beings that we must now consider as a class of entities, which, although their number is limited, have acquired disproportionate importance due to their intimate connection with one of the great movements of modern times. These entities, although certainly of human origin, diverge so much from the course of ordinary evolution that they can be considered artificial beings in a certain sense. Their history takes us back to the time of Atlantis, before the Atlantean civilization sank into selfishness and degradation, producing much that was noble and admirable. Among its leaders were some who reached remarkable heights in human development. Among the lodges of occult study that preceded initiation, there was one in America, a tributary of the divine governors of the Golden Gate, one of the great Atlantean monarchs. Thus the ancient medieval tale of the magician, torn apart by the demons he himself created, is not a mere fable, but may have a terrible real basis. Sometimes these creatures escape the control of those who try to use them for various reasons, becoming wandering and purposeless demons, like some mentioned in the previous episode, in similar situations. However, the writings we consider, due to their superior intelligence, power and longevity, are proportionately more dangerous. They constantly seek ways to prolong their lives, feeding like vampires on human vitality or influencing to be offered sacrifices. Sometimes in simple and wild tribes, they manage to be recognized as gods of the people or family through clever manipulations. These deities that demand sacrifices involving blood are considered the lowest and most repugnant class of this order, and other less objectionable entities sometimes settle for offerings of rice and cooked food. In certain parts of India, both varieties can be found thriving today, through the food they obtain from offerings, and even more through the vitality extracted from their devotees, they extend their existence for many years, even centuries, retaining enough strength to occasionally perform light phenomena to stimulate the faith and zeal of their followers. Moreover, they always become unpleasant in any way if the usual sacrifices are neglected. For instance, it has recently been claimed that in an Indian village, when the local deity did not receive its regular meals for some reason, alarming spontaneous suicides occurred between the huts, sometimes three or four at a time in cases where human action could not be suspected. Other stories of similar nature would come to mind for any listener familiar with the remote corners of this astonishing country. 
the art of creating artificially virulent and powerful elementals seems to have been a specialty of the mages of Atlantis, known as the Lords of the Dark Face. An example of their abilities is mentioned in The Secret Doctrine, where it is related about the marvellous speaking animals that had to be appeased with blood to avoid awakening their masters and warning them of impending destruction. These mages also created other artificial entities of such enormous power and energy that it is obscurely suggested that some of them have disturbed even to this day. Despite more than 11,000 years having passed since the cataclysm that destroyed their original masters, the terrible Indian goddess whose followers were driven to commit the terrible crimes of Tuje, the dreadful Kali, venerated even today with rituals too abominable to be described, might be a relic of a system that had to be eradicated, even at the cost of the submergence of a continent and the loss of 65 million human lives. Three human artificial beings that we must now consider as a class of entities which, although their number is limited, have acquired disproportionate importance due to their intimate connection with one of the great movements of modern times. These entities, although certainly of human origin, diverge so much from the course of ordinary evolution that they can be considered artificial beings in a certain sense. Their history takes us back to the time of Atlantis, before the Atlantean civilization sank into selfishness and degradation, producing much that was noble and admirable. Among its leaders were some who reached remarkable heights in human development. Among the lodges of occult study that preceded initiation, there was one in America, a tributary of the divine governors of the Golden Gate, one of the great Atlantean monarchs. Despite vicissitudes and changes, this lodge has persisted to this day, preserving its ancient ritual and maintaining the Atlantean language as its sacred and secret language. This lodge remains what it was from the beginning, a congregation of occultists for noble and philanthropic purposes, capable of guiding worthy students on the path of knowledge and conferring psychic powers upon those who demonstrate appropriate attitudes through demanding trials. Their masters do not reach the level of adepts, but hundreds of disciples have progressed sufficiently through this lodge to advance on the path that will eventually lead them to become adepts in future lives. Although this lodge is not in direct communication with the Brotherhood of the Himalayas, some of the adepts have had connections with them in past lives, which sparks a particularly friendly interest in their activities and progress, although they remain always in the background. The leaders of this lodge have at times contributed to the progress of truth in the world. Fifty years ago, alarmed by rampant materialism affecting spirituality in Europe and America, they decided to take unusual measures to counteract it. Thus, they offered opportunities for any reasonable person to find solid evidence of a life beyond the physical body, which science was accustomed to deny. The phenomena they presented were not new as they could be found throughout history, but their systematic organization was an innovation in the modern world. In this way, they initiated modern spiritualism, which led many skeptics to firm belief in some form of future life. Although the results were impressive, some critics, with a broader view of affairs, felt the cost was high and evil outweighed good. The method they employed involved bringing a deceased person onto the astral plane, instructing them in their abilities, and then placing them at the head of a spiritualist circle. These entities, in turn, developed other deceased personalities into mediums, thus allowing spiritualism to spread. Although some living members of the original lodge may occasionally manifest in astral form in certain circles, most confine themselves to providing direction and guidance to those under their care. Over time, the movement grew so rapidly that it escaped their control, so in many subsequent events, they could only be considered indirectly responsible. The increase in astral activity among those designated to lead spiritualist circles clearly delayed their natural progress, although it was thought that any loss would be compensated by the good karma generated by guiding others to truth. Prolonged use of a spirit guide was found to cause severe and permanent damage. Different approaches were attempted, such as replacing guides or creating artificial human entities. Initially, lodge members manipulated the shadow left by the deceased guide to appear before the circle as if present. However, this method proved inadequate, and it was eventually decided that the successor to the spirit guide 
must take possession of their shadow or envelope to continue appearing within. Some Lodge members objected that this could be considered deceptive, but it was argued that since the shadow still contained some of the original lesser mana, it was not deceitful. It is important to note that no member of the Brotherhood of Adepts supported the creation of artificial entities, although they could not interfere with those who chose to follow this path. However, this practice might be adopted by others beyond the original Lodge, suggesting the possibility that black mages might also provide communicating spirits. With this, we conclude our study on the inhabitants of the astral plane. While this catalogue may be considered fairly comprehensive, it is essential to remember that it provides only a general overview of a vast subject, the detailed development of which would require a lifetime of study and effort. Throughout this work, several supernatural phenomena have been mentioned and to some extent explained. Before concluding, it may be useful to summarize and provide a list of those most commonly encountered by students in these matters, as well as to show which agencies generally cause them. However, the resources of the astral world are so diverse that almost any known phenomenon can be produced by various forms, allowing only general rules to be established in this field. Apparitions or ghosts are a good example supporting what was mentioned earlier. In the vague form in which these terms are commonly used, they can refer to any inhabitant of the astral plane. Of course, people with developed psychic abilities constantly see these kinds of things. However, for an ordinary person to see a ghost, as often said, one of two things must happen. Either the ghost must materialize or the person must have a brief flash of psychic perception. Since neither of these events is common, ghosts are not as common in our streets as living people. If someone observes a ghost flying around a grave, it is probably the ethereal envelope of a recently buried person, although it could also be the astral body of a living individual wandering asleep near a friend's grave. Another possibility is that it could be a materialized thought form, that is, an artificial elemental created by the energy someone projects by imagining themselves present at that specific location. For a person accustomed to using astral vision, these different varieties would be easily distinguishable, but someone without experience might vaguely call them ghosts. Deathbed apparitions are not at all rare and are often truly sightings of the dying, visits made by the astral form of the dying person just before what we might call the moment of dissolution. However, it is also likely that these apparitions are mental forms created by the intense desire of the dying person to see a friend one last time before moving to an unknown state. Apparitions at locations where a crime has been committed are generally mental projections created by the criminal themselves, whether living or especially after their death. These mental projections result from their recurrent thoughts about the circumstances of the crime. The intensity of these thoughts naturally increases on the anniversary of the original crime, explaining why some manifestations of this type occur periodically. Another aspect related to these phenomena is that any place where there has been a deep emotional disturbance such as terror, pain, grief, overwhelming hatred or any intense passion leaves a marked imprint in the astral light. Anyone with even slight psychic ability will be deeply affected by this impression. If their psychic sensitivity is temporarily heightened, they may visualize the entire crime scene, perceiving events and details as if they were happening before their own eyes. In such a situation, this person might believe the place is haunted and that they have seen a ghost. In fact, even those without psychic abilities may feel uncomfortable visiting places like those mentioned. For example, some feel disturbed when passing near the tree of Tibar and cannot stay in Madame Tussaud's chamber of horrors without being aware that their discomfort stems from the shocking impressions existing in the astral light around these places and objects evoking horror and crime. Moreover, these places are often surrounded by repugnant astral entities that still swarm around these centers. The typical family ghost present in supernatural stories can be interpreted in several ways. It could be a thought form, a very vivid impression in the astral light, or even an earthbound ancestor who continues to frequent places that were significant to them in life. Other mentioned apparitions take the form of bell sounds, stone lamentations, or broken crockery. 
These manifestations are often the work of elemental forces set in motion by the clumsiness of someone ignorant, seeking to draw attention from surviving friends. Or it could also be the result of mischievous intent from a nature spirit with a childlike personality. Nature spirits are also responsible for fairy tales that are common in certain regions of the country. Sometimes individuals experiencing temporary clairvoyant episodes not uncommon among inhabitants of isolated mountainous regions may observe the joyous games of these entities. Occasionally these creatures may play strange and terrifying tricks, creating mirages and causing people to see things that do not actually exist. In some cases, an individual may go through a series of astonishing imaginary adventures and suddenly realize that their entire bright environment has vanished, leaving them alone in a lonely valley or windy plain. However, it is important to exercise caution in accepting all popular legends on this subject, as they are often intertwined with the grossest superstition. As demonstrated in a recent and terrible murder case in Ireland, many of the physical phenomena during seances are attributed to these same entities. It is a proven fact that these mischievous creatures have disrupted many seances, surprising everyone with their astonishing acts. Among their abilities are answering questions and conveying messages through knocks or tilts, displaying spiritual lights, attracting objects from a distance, reading thoughts and materializing writings or drawings. Indeed, only nature spirits, if they so decide, could offer seances as marvelous as the most astonishing ones ever known. Their power of enchantment would allow them to persuade the present circle that they have even recreated the most challenging phenomena, unless there is an observer trained to understand their maneuvers and challenge them. However, when tricks and jokes are presented during a seance, there may be the presence of low-class nature spirits or degraded beings who find pleasure in such ridiculous performances. Regarding entities that can communicate during a seance or speak through a medium in trance, they are numerous. Practically all classes of inhabitants of the astral plane can manifest during these sessions. Although it is possible that some spirits are genuine in their claims, the chances of this happening are slim, and discerning truth from deception proves extremely difficult. Even if a spirit presents itself as someone's lost brother and provides details that only he and the alleged brother know, the recipient of the communication cannot be certain of its authenticity. They are aware that the spirit could have read the information from their mind or environment on the astral plane. Even when unknown information is provided and later verified, doubts remain as to whether this information comes from the astral record or if what is seen is just a shadow of the deceased brother having access to his memory but not being himself. It is no longer denied that during some seances, significant and authentic communications from genuine entities have occurred. However, the reality is that the ordinary person attending a seance can never be sure they are not being deceived in several ways, as deception is a constant possibility. In some cases, members of the lodge of occultists belonging to the spiritist movement have shared valuable teachings on profound subjects through a medium. However, this occurred during strictly private family seances, not during public presentations for which money was exchanged. To understand how certain physical phenomena occur, it is necessary to understand the different astral resources available to those operating on the astral plane. This branch of the subject can be difficult to clarify due to certain necessary restrictions. The astral plane can be considered in many ways as an extension of the physical plane where matter can take on an intangible ethereal state for us, but purely physical. This conception resembles the Hindu idea of Jirat, the waking state where the physical and astral planes are combined into seven subdivisions corresponding to the four conditions of physical matter and the three major divisions of astral matter mentioned earlier. With this idea in mind, it is easy to understand that astral vision or perception can be defined from a certain point of view as the ability to receive a wide spectrum of different vibrations in our physical bodies. Only a small set of slow vibrations are perceived as sound, another faster set as light, and another as electrical action. However, there are countless intermediate vibrations that our physical senses cannot capture. If these intermediate vibrations, with all the complexities of their wavelength differences, were perceptible on the astral plane, 
our understanding of nature could significantly increase at that level, and we would have access to a great deal of information that is currently hidden from us. It is true that certain beings on the astral plane can easily pass through solid matter, which helps to scientifically explain certain peculiarities of astral vision. Those who adhere to the theory of the fourth dimension find a clearer and more complete explanation there. The clairvoyant ability derived from possessing astral vision allows a being to perform acts that seemed astonishing to us, such as reading a closed book or reading others' thoughts. It is important to note that true, trained and reliable clairvoyance involves other faculties such as foresight and second sight, which belong to a higher plane than the astral plane and are not part of the current subject. However, it is relevant to mention that exact foresight entirely belongs to the higher plane, but flashes or reflections of this ability also manifest in astral vision, especially in simple-minded individuals living under suitable conditions. A well-known example is what is called second sight among the Highlanders of Scotland. In addition to perceiving ethereal vibrations, any intelligent inhabitant of the astral plane can also, if they have learned how to do so, adapt these vibrations to their own purposes or set them in motion themselves. This adds a dimension of skill and manipulation to the astral plane. It will be evident that subjects related to supernatural forces and methods for manipulating them are currently difficult to address in publications. However, there are reasons to believe that in the near future, some of their applications will be known to the general public. Although it is possible to give a general idea of these forces without exceeding the limits of what is allowed, those with experience in spiritist seances, where physical results manifest, have witnessed evidence of the use of a virtually irresistible force, such as the instantaneous movement of heavy objects. If one adopts a scientific approach, it is natural to question the origin of these forces and how they are used. There are several ways to achieve this work, but for now, we will mention four. First, there are large ethereal currents that constantly traverse the surface of the Earth, from pole to pole. Their volume makes them powerful, akin to the force of a rising tide. There are methods to harness this impressive force using ethereal pressure, although inadequate control can lead to serious dangers. Next, there is a kind of ethereal pressure comparable to atmospheric pressure, but significantly greater. In our daily lives, we are rarely aware of both pressures, though they both exist. If science could exhaust ether in a given space as it does with air, it would be possible to test this ethereal pressure similarly. However, the difficulty lies in the fact that matter in the ethereal state eludes current means of physics. We hope that in the future, more knowledge about these forces and their applications will be revealed, allowing for a deeper understanding of the phenomena involved. However, practical occultism teaches how to achieve this and thereby unleash the formidable force of ethereal pressure. Thirdly, there is a considerable reserve of potential energy that has remained latent in matter during its evolution from the subtle to the denser. By changing the condition of matter, some of this energy is typically released and utilized in a manner similar to the release of latent heat through a change in the condition of visible matter. Fourthly, we can achieve many surprising results, large and small, by extending sympathetic vibration, a principle akin to the sympathetic vibration. Although illustrations taken from the physical plane can often distort more than clarify astral phenomena due to their partial applicability, two simple facts of everyday life can help us understand this important branch of our subject. If we take care not to push the analogy beyond its limits, it is widely known that if we vigorously vibrate a string of a harp, this will generate sympathetic vibrations in the corresponding strings of any number of harps played around as long as they are tuned exactly to the same pitch. Similarly, when crossing a suspension bridge, a large body of soldiers needs to break step to prevent their regular marching from causing a vibration that intensifies with each step. Although only partial, they are more understandable for those who know the precise speed to initiate their vibrations, that is, the keynote of the class of matter they wish to affect. They can trigger a large number of sympathetic vibrations by sounding this keynote on the physical plane. This does not generate additional energy, but on the astral plane, where matter is less inert, 
sympathetic vibrations set in motion the matter's own life force, thus multiplying the original impulse many times over through rhythmic repetition of the original impulse. Just like the soldiers on the bridge, vibrations can intensify to produce results that seem disproportionate at first glance compared to the original cause. In fact, one could argue that the conceivable achievements of this force in the hands of a great adept who fully understands its possibilities are practically limitless, as the very construction of the universe arises from vibrations established by spoken word, mantras or spells that achieve their results through the perception of certain sounds also depend on the action of sympathetic vibration for their effectiveness, without the need to control an elemental. The phenomenon of disintegration occurs when extremely rapid vibrations are applied, exceeding the cohesion of the molecules of an object, leading it into an ethereal state. Even higher vibrations of this kind will separate molecules into their constituent atoms. A body reduced to the ethereal state in this manner can be swiftly moved by an astral current from one place to another, and when the force that placed it in this condition is withdrawn, it will be propelled by ethereal pressure to resume its original form. This process explains how, in spiritist seances, objects can be brought from great distances almost instantaneously. When they disintegrate, they can easily pass through solid substances like walls or closed boxes, as the passage of matter through matter is as simple as the passage of water through a sieve or gas through liquid in a chemical experiment. Since it is possible to alter vibrations, to change matter from the solid state to the ethereal state, it is also possible to reverse the process and bring ethereal matter back to the solid state. Just as in disintegration, continuous effort of will is required to prevent the object from reverting to its original form. In materialization, constant effort is needed to prevent the materialized matter from returning to the ethereal condition. In common materializations during spiritist seances, the necessary matter is borrowed as much as possible from the medium's ethereal double, which is detrimental to their health and presents other disadvantages. This explains why the material form is strictly limited to the immediate proximity of the medium and is subject to an attraction that constantly returns it to the body from which it originated. The reason why spiritist seance conductors prefer to operate in darkness or with dim lighting is explained by their inability to maintain a materialized form or spirit hand for more than a few seconds amidst the intense vibrations caused by bright light. Those familiar with these seances will have noticed that materializations fall into three categories. Firstly, those that are tangible but invisible. Secondly, those that are visible but intangible. And thirdly, those that are both visible and tangible. In the first category, the most common are the invisible hands of spirits that often stroke the faces of those present or move small objects in the room, as well as the vocal organs from which the direct voice emanates. In this case, a type of matter is used that neither reflects nor obstructs light, but under certain conditions can generate vibrations in the atmosphere that are perceived as sound. A variant of this category is a form of partial materialization which, although it cannot reflect visible light, can affect certain ultraviolet rays, allowing a more or less defined impression on film, resulting in what are called spirit photographs. When the available energy is not sufficient for perfect materialization, sometimes a form with a vaporous appearance corresponding to our second category is obtained. In such cases, spirits warn participants not to touch the appearing forms. The rarest case is that of a complete materialization where there is enough power to maintain a form that can be seen and touched, at least for a few moments. Regarding adepts or students who need to materialize their astral body for any reason, they do not draw on their own ethereal double or that of others, as they have learned to directly extract necessary matter from astral light or even regular light. There is another phenomenon closely related to the mentioned subject called duplication. This process is carried out by forming a perfect mental image of the object one wishes to duplicate in astral light, then gathering the necessary physical matter around this image. Of course, for this to work, it is essential to keep in mind every particle, both inside and outside the object, to be duplicated simultaneously, which requires considerable concentration. 
people who cannot directly extract necessary matter from astral light sometimes borrow matter from the original object, proportionally reducing its weight. In theosophical literature, there are numerous references to the precipitation of letters or images. This result can be achieved in various ways. For example, an adept who wishes to communicate with someone may place a sheet of paper in front of them, form a mental image of the writing they wish to see appear on it, and extract from astral light the necessary matter to materialize this image. Similarly, they could produce the same result on a sheet of paper in front of their correspondent, regardless of the distance between them. Another common method to save time is to imprint all the substance of the letter in the pupil's mind and allow them to perform the mechanical work of precipitation. The pupil would then take their sheet of paper and, imagining that they see the letter written on it by their master's hand, proceed to materialize the writing, as described earlier. If it were difficult for them to simultaneously perform both operations of extracting matter from astral light and precipitating writing on paper, they might have ordinary ink or a bit of colored powder at hand, which, being physical matter, could be extracted more easily. It is evident that possessing this power would be a very dangerous tool in the hands of an unscrupulous person, as mimicking someone else's handwriting would be as simple as that of another person, and it would be practically impossible to detect such forgery by conventional means. A disciple firmly linked to a master always has an infallible proof to know whether a message truly comes from that master or not. However, for others, the proof of its origin must exclusively reside in the content of the letter and the spirit it conveys through it, as the handwriting, no matter how skillfully done, is absolutely devoid of value as proof. Regarding speed, a novice student in the art of precipitation would probably only be capable of visualizing a few words at a time, advancing scarcely faster than if they were writing the letter conventionally. However, a more experienced individual capable of visualizing an entire page or even the whole letter at once would perform the task more easily. Thus, it sometimes happens that quite extensive letters are written in just a few seconds during a spiritist session. Regarding the precipitation of a painting, the method is exactly the same, except that it is crucial to visualize the entire scene at once. If multiple colors are required, this further complicates the making, separate maintenance and precise reproduction of the exact shades of the scene to be represented. This clearly demands the exercise of artistic ability and it should not be assumed that every inhabitant of the astral plane can produce a painting as good through this method. Similarly, an individual who was a great artist in their lifetime and thus learned to see and appreciate details would have much more success in precipitation than an ordinary person if they attempted it while on the astral plane after death. Regarding slate writing, some of the greatest mediums have succeeded under test conditions, sometimes through precipitation. However, most often, the pencil piece between the slates is guided by a spirit hand, of which only the necessary parts are materialized to hold it and perform the writing. Levitation involves the floating of a human body in the air. In the case of a medium, this generally occurs when they are lifted by spirit hands. However, there is another more scientific method used in the East and sometimes elsewhere. Occultism knows a way to neutralize or even completely reverse the force of gravity, making levitation phenomena easily achievable. This knowledge was undoubtedly related to the use of aerial vessels in ancient India and Atlantis, which were raised from the ground and made light enough to be easily moved and directed. It is likely that this same knowledge of the subtlest forces of nature facilitated the construction of colossal structures like pyramids and megaliths by manipulating large blocks of stone. On the astral plane, Inhabitants have access to knowledge of natural forces that allow them to produce what are called spirit lights, whether slightly phosphorescent, dazzling, or even the curious luminous globules that some classes of fire elementals can easily transform. Since light consists of vibrations of the ether, those who understand how to establish these vibrations can produce any type of light they desire. The use of ethereal elemental essence also allows manipulation of fire without suffering damage. Although there are other methods to do this, the finest layer of ethereal substance can be manipulated to be completely impervious to heat, 
allowing a medium or practitioner to handle glowing coal or red-hot iron without any risk. We have mentioned most of the events that occurred during a seance, but there are still one or two more unusual phenomena from the outside world that we must include in our list. The transmutation of metals was considered a mere dream of medieval alchemists. However, there is evidence that they succeeded in this process several times. Nowadays, some magicians in the East claim to do it under controlled conditions. In any case, since the basic atom is the same in all substances and differs only in the methods of combination, anyone capable of reducing a piece of metal to its atomic state and rearranging its atoms into another form would have no difficulty in performing transmutation on any desired scale. The principle of sympathetic vibration mentioned earlier also explains the strange and little-known phenomenon called repercussion, whereby any injury or mark inflicted on the astral body during its wanderings is reflected on the physical body. In witchcraft trials of the Middle Ages, traces of this phenomenon are found, as it was asserted on several occasions, that wounds inflicted on a witch, while in the form of an animal, like a dog or wolf, appeared at the corresponding spot on her human body. This same strange law has sometimes also led to unjust accusations of fraud against a medium. For example, if a kind of colouring material was found on the hand of the materialised spirit, it was then discovered to be also present on the hand of the medium. The explanation lies in the fact that in this case, the spirit was simply the astral body of the medium, or perhaps even their etheric double, compelled by directing influences to take a form different from their own. In fact, the astral and physical bodies are so intimately connected that it is impossible to strike the keynote of one without immediately causing precisely corresponding vibrations in the other. In conclusion, it is hoped that those who have shown sufficient interest to follow this treatise to this point may have a general idea of the astral plane and its possibilities. This would enable them to correctly understand and place in their scheme all the facts related to it that they encounter in their study. Although only an extensive subject has been outlined, it may be sufficient to highlight the primordial importance of astral perception in the study of biology, physics, chemistry, astronomy, medicine and history, as well as the significant impetus that its development could provide across these sciences. However, it is crucial to understand that the acquisition of astral perception should not be seen as an end in itself. Any method adopted for this purpose would inevitably lead to the so-called Lawik method of development, which focuses on acquiring psychic powers for the current personality. Unfortunately, these powers can easily be misused as they are not adequately safeguarded. This approach includes systems involving the use of drugs, the invocation of elementals or Kriya Yoga practices. On the other hand, there is another method called Lok Tara, which relies on Raj Yoga or spiritual progress. Although this may be a slower process, Everything gained through this path is earned for the permanent individuality and is never lost. Furthermore, the care and guidance of a master ensure perfect safety against the misuse of power as long as their instructions are scrupulously followed. The opening of astral vision should simply be considered a step in the development of something infinitely more noble. It is just a small step on the great ascending path that leads men to the sublime heights of adeptship and beyond, to glorious views of wisdom and power that our limited minds cannot conceive at present. However, let no one believe that having an expanded vision of the astral plane is a blessing without difficulty, for upon those on whom this vision opens, pain and misery, evil and the world's greed press like an ever-present burden. Often one is inclined to echo Schiller's passionate admonition, Why have you cast me into the city of the blind to proclaim your oracle with open eyes? Give me back this sad clairvoyance, take away from my eyes this cruel light, give me back my blindness, the happiness of my senses, take back your frightening gift. It is possible that this sentiment is not unnatural in the early stages of the path. However, as the student progresses and gains higher vision and deeper knowledge, they soon find perfect certainty that all things work together for the ultimate good of all.